saw that in an arcade. Actually, it was at a 7-Eleven. And he did such a nice job of uh, simulating it here. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Darn. What are the circular things that they're spinning out there? Weapons. They fire the... Uh, they fire shots at you. Oh, I was thinking maybe you're trying to shoot through the center of one and get extra points or something. No, that was in Sausage Party, oh. where the hot dog jumps through the middle of the uh, bagel. <laughs> okay, are we about ready to start? We're I think we're streaming now. I'm going to just put my headphones into my tablet. Oh, okay. okay. How if you like to announce this one? I don't have a uh, title screen today. No title screen. Uh, Jim's got one built in. Um, I oh, just took the star escape for the... Mm -hmm. Actually, I might. Are we on? Or? Yes. No. We're live. You want to talk into that one live the way to Mike? Yeah. Well... Here we are in uh, beautiful downtown Evanston again for the December 2018 uh, version of the Chicago TI User Group Show. Uh, present today are our president, uh, Vic Sturp, our technical director, uh, Jim Mazurk, uh, Owen Brandt, and Buck Brandt. Uh, and I'm Buck Brandt. You're Buck Brandt, that's right. Uh, and um, and me, uh, Hal Shanfield. Uh We've got a lot of exciting stuff to uh, demo today, so I'm going to turn this over to uh, Vic, and he will um, begin the program. Vic, here's the microphone. Okay. The uh, flip it down. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. I do have the cartridge in here. Yeah. We've got plenty of room so you can run sure. a cable, I should say. Okay. Now, that's what happens when you have extended basic on that's built into your console. There we go. All right, this is a multi card I got from uh, James Fenster a couple years ago at the TI Fair. And it's a uh, multi-cart with 512K of programs loaded. And these come in like, what, a 256, a 512, a 1000. Uh, so we have Star Wars, Star Trap. Uh, John Phillips did the Stargazer 1, 2, 3. We demoed that a couple years ago. Munchman 2, variation of Munchman. Face Chase, again, John Phillips, D Station 1 and 2. A 4A Flyer. A flight simulator. Uh, Link, I think that's a terminal emulator. And you can see at the lower left of the screen, we have press one to four. There's the page two, uh, TI Toad, TI Planner. A, a very nice small spreadsheet if you don't need uh, 500 columns and 1,000 rows. Uh, you just need 10 or 20. It's a great cartridge uh, spreadsheet. Spies Demise, the uh, elevator game. Space Patrol, Prototyper. Peripheral test, test all your peripherals. Uh, H is one of my favorites, Midnight Mason, based on the old uh, Load Runner type game where you're running through a building and monsters pursue you. And you can actually uh, use dynamite and blow a hole in the floor behind you to trap them, at least for a little time. Escape build, Burger Builder, a variation of Burger Time. Breakthrough, another uh, breakthrough type game. Smash the Blocks, Boxer, Black Hole. 99 Home Century. I haven't run that. Does that use the uh, um, the Radio Shack uh, remote controls for outlets? I don't know. Let's run it and find yeah. out. Okay. Ah, the core count. Check controller connections. Press enter to continue. Okay, there is no co uh, core comp uh, controller hooked up to this, so we can't do anything with this, pro this program. Mm -hmm. I guess I should have brought my core comp home sentry controller with me today. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's still on. Hang on. It's controlling. Uh, no, this is one of those cartridges that has a memory. You actually have to turn the. Uh, 
I have a, uh, I have the original prototype of this at home. It's got two uh, dip switches on the front to select the banks. Ah, okay. There we go. Two Rotor Raiders Romax demo. Uh, Romax demos, I guess, are a little uh, scarce. Uh, our old friend Video Vegas, we've run this uh, quite a few times. I noticed it's currently on the uh, TI 99ers Facebook page. Uh, somebody was talking about it. Uh, you can bet one, two, or three dollars. And Dr. Eric Bray was nice enough uh, to respond to me. I said, What happens if you get down to zero on this? Uh, I know what happens in TI Casino if you try to leave the casino and you don't, don't pay back the ready teller the money they loaned you when you walked in. Is uh, Bruno shows up and he yeah. says, uh, are you forgetting something? Uh, I'll pay you a visit later. So yeah, you can just press the space bar. You can press one, two, or three. I, I always wager big. I'll bet $3 here. You can see in the upper right corner it's changed. Uh, somebody said, how come the arm doesn't move? And they had figured it might have been because of uh, memory constraints. Uh, they also demonstrated somebody played this game long enough, they took a screenshot of every one of those possible winnings there in the upper right corner of the machine. Mm -hmm. And then they showed one that's a loser. Three bells. You don't get anything with three bells. And uh, he went, loser. So that was pretty funny. This was the first uh, released uh, Funware game. This was the first one Funware ever put out from my, what I understand. That's why it's the hardest one to find. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, yeah, this should win us something. You have a copy, yeah. right? should win us at least yeah. Yeah, I've played this game and I've tried to bust and it, I've never run it down to zero. Or never been able to. Because it always winds up winning something. But yeah, the action is good, the sound's good, the clink of the coins. Gee, remember that at a casino before they printed out a piece of paper? Mm. Yeah, that's the only reason I ever played. Boo hiss. Just to hear that little clink, clink, clink. Uh, yeah, there's been uh, other casino uh, type, uh, one-armed bandit type games, but uh, this is the best of the bunch because uh, it shows so much of the real uh, spinning. It's not just a little window with a little tiny graphic changing. It's so much of it. Oh, there you go. 16, huh? Or 18. 18 times 3. Yeah. So this is going to take a while. <laughs> you could actually quit a winner here. Mm hmm. Which is strictly not allowed in a casino. Mm -hmm. uh, they come after you, they put you in the room. To walk out with more money than you walked in with? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They don't like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're not in the business of giving away money. Mm -hmm. Now everyone carries a computer in their pocket with them. I remember when that was a no-no. Mm -hmm. Computing devices. And yeah. On the floor. And yeah. And if they catch you counting cards, they, oh well, yeah, you're up on. Uh, yeah. What was the one with? Uh, uh, black and white movie, I think, was Steve McQueen. He was a naval officer, and he was using the government's computers on his aircraft carrier to bust the bank at Monte Carlo, and they were sending. Uh, Morse code signals, uh, what do you call that spotlight that can flicker the... Uh, oh, that's an Aldous lamp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were sending signals from shore to the ship and back again on what numbers the roulette wheel was coming up with, and they were using the ship computer to figure out what the next logical number would be. And uh, the Russians, of course, they were monitoring this, and they said there's signals in between the shore and this aircraft carrier. It's all numbers between zero and what's the highest in roulette, 32, 42, something like that. What could that be, the Russian admiral asks, and the radio operator goes, roulette? And he gets berated for, you know, for that. Yeah, 125. Well, just like at Vegas, I think I'm going to quit as a winner here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
I brought Malamars, guys. It's that time of year. Uh -oh. Interesting story about Malamars. They only shipped them in the winter months. Because when they first came out 120 years ago, chocolate did not ship well. <laughs> they didn't have refrigerated cars, so now ah. they still for tradition only ship these in the winter months. Okay. Yeah, so this cartridge is bad. I gotta send this one back to James. Because these uh, first four or five options uh, are all the same program. Like if I press E here for homework helper, oh, that came up. Make a liar out of me. For many years since I had one of those. Mm -hmm. They're delicious. Uh, paint and print, GP1000, paint and print. Easy killer. No, it's working now. Okay. So this cartridge is working fine. What else do we have? Oh, rich extended basic. Didn't I have a. Uh... Red Baron somewhere around here. I think it's in my. Uh... Big box of notes down here. I tossed in a Red Baron cartridge. There's one right back here. That okay. One. All right, yeah. Oh, that one's, in, that one's on a uh, beige shell. Mine's in black. Oh, you probably have to have a full collection of every color now. <laughs> and they will color too, right? Now I need to find a beige one. I don't get stuff a 3D printer and you make one. No kidding. That's what my son has been doing. He's been making me uh, cartridges and I... Testing them out for him. Yeah. See how low Okay. Is. White so, and green. Well, two, yeah. yeah, two things I wanted to demo today was Red Baron, a.k.a. Spad 13, and also a peg jump game. So where's my Red Baron book? Again... Red Baron came out in, uh, what, 1988? I'm going to be your videographer here. Okay. Different room. Okay. So Red Baron came out in 1980 or 1988, or actually the game was called SPAD 13 on a floppy disk. And SPAD 13 was good but didn't have a Red Baron in it. So they upgraded the floppy to Mark II that had additional controls and also combat against the Red Baron himself. Uh, it had some other enhancements. Then when they came to cartridge, they came out with Red Baron. They changed the name. So that's the difference between the two programs. Around 1990, I had scanned this small manual to make it bigger so it would be easier for me to read. And they go through... Another difference in Red Baron versus SPAD 13 Mark I is you can start either at the French airfield or you can start at 2,000 feet flying over the trenches, over the German airfield, or you can already be at the Eiffel Tower. You don't have to fly all the way there. Some folks complain about the slow speed of this, and it's an, actually an accurate simulation of flying a 150 mile an hour biplane. That's its maximum speed. Uh, you fly by the seat of your pants. There's no Microsoft flight simulator like God's View uh, where you're looking down and you see the scenery and you see your airplane. No, it's uh, all from the cockpit. Although you can look straight ahead, you can look straight up, you can look straight down through the airplane to the right, to the left, and you can look straight behind you. This shows what happens if you stall. Uh, this shows how to do a correct landing where you come in, kill your speed, and you land. If you come in too steep, you crash. If you come in too shallow, you stall and you crash. I always like to go to the Eiffel Tower and vomit. Yeah. Uh, they recommend you have this page of the booklet open as you're flying as a shortcut of telling you what everything is. Uh, so here the Red Baron cartridge, it's going to ask us, do we want to have to fight the Red Baron? They recommend that you don't for your first flights, that you're going to have your hands full trying to fly this thing. So I'll have to say N for no. 
now choose to start at the front field, you're stopped. You're on the runway, you're parked, the engine's off. So you have to, you know, start the engine, use the speed control to speed it up. Let's see now, which one is your speed control here? The throttle. Yeah. The one on top. Oh, yeah. Uh, T is throttle up and V is throttle down. Here, let me show the instructions here. Is here they show your dashboard and here's your keyboard overlay. They recommend you have this opened up as you're doing it. So uh, if we start at the French field, okay, the engine's idling and the uh, center instruments are compass, we're pointed north. This is our altitude, it's at zero. This is our fuel, a full tank. I think this machine has like a 200 mile range. And the one on the right is our air speed. So if we throttle up, the machine will pretty much take off. Your altitude is dependent on your engine speed, not really on the rudder. The rudder you can use to bobble around a bit, but you shouldn't depend on it to either go up or go down. You should use your throttle. So let's, uh, let's uh, speed it up. I'll press the T key. No, that's our stick. Oh, number eight, throttles up. Uh, there's the throttle in the lower left corner. We don't have a tachometer. Now the tail will pick up automatically and the horizon will be slightly below the gun sight or at the gun sight. And they say when your speed reaches, yeah, we're already lifting off and I haven't touched the rudder. There's clouds up in the sky. need our instructions again. So So your altitude right now is 900? Yeah, they recommend you get up to like 500 or 1,000 feet. Uh, this thing has a ceiling of 21,000 feet, which is higher than the pilot can stand. Say they didn't have oxygen in those days. Now, if I finish banking, you can bank at about a 45 degree angle, but a, a 40 degree angle, but a 45, uh, you'll lose altitude too much. There, okay. And uh, there's the airfield we took off from down there. Nice. Uh, if I press number six and look straight down, there it is. We're looking down now. How about that? The uh, wind is out of the west at 10 knots. Now, how do I get back up to... There's our front view. You can look left. You can look right. You can look directly behind you. You can look straight up. And what was number six? Straight down. So it's a fun game. Uh, yeah, you're not flying that fast. And they recommend that you actually have a, uh, like a sweep secondhand watch or timepiece in front of you, because the instructions will say, take off, reach this altitude. Oh, we're burning through fuel here, folks. Uh, you're supposed to also throttle down once you get uh, to your, uh, desired altitude, otherwise you'll just, uh... now we're at steady level flight when the horizon is about in the middle of your uh, gun sight. And the aircraft will bobble up and down, but it's pretty much stable, uh, which can help save your bacon if you get in a stall or you get into a spin. A lot of times it's just taking your hands off the controls and once you figure out where you're at, actually doing a dive to get enough air speed so your controls work again. 
Now let me go through the instructions here. Uh, since this is uh, Mark II, I can press P for pan and it will automatically keep going through everything, like looking for trouble. If you're getting shot at, you don't know where the gunfire is coming from. And if we press one again, it'll be just looking forward again. Press M for the map. Oh, there's the sun. Yeah, there's the map. Uh, there's uh, the airfield, some trenches. Uh, they have a suggestion where you can fl fly over the River Seine. Is that how it's pronounced? Yeah. Uh, you can fly over German fortifications and. Uh, they shoot at you over the. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you get points for uh, bombing the uh, enemy hangars. You'll be able to tell that from your airfield because it uh, has two hangars and your airfield has one. Oh. Uh, there are villages here. There's the Eiffel Tower. There's other stuff involved. You can do an inside loop with this aircraft. It's powerful enough to do that. You can't do an outside loop with the, uh, with the uh, SPAD-13. They have the specs on it. You can do in aerobatics. And, uh, they have a page that shows you the nomenclature for the various parts of your aircraft. They have a page on aerobatics, uh, turns and extreme turns, climbing and stalling, a barrel roll, a loop. You can do a Nimbleman or a split S. Um, I have to get back to our instructions here. Do a press F and that's a hard bank. Notice how we're uh, losing altitude here when you bank this hard. Uh, I want to get headed, uh, I think, east, which was a hard way of doing it here because I'm have to do a uh, uh, 270 degree turn. Okay, do a hard bank to the left, and we should uh, gotta do another one to the left. Hmm. Those are trenches down there, big? Yeah. Yeah. Can you go down and line them up? No, I'm gonna try. I always like to shoot, I always used to like to blow up the Eiffel Tower, fly through the legs. If you uh -huh. see the Eiffel Tower, you can fly through the legs, uh -huh. get out the bomb, and kind of like you're under it. Yeah. It's yeah, where is our bomb here? It's, uh, oh, the letter B key. So I'll just drop a bomb, and we'll look down, which would be six. Here's six, looking down, and B for bomb. falling behind us pretty far. We probably aren't going to see the explosion. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I think we, I think we scared them, but I don't think we could have. I don't think we got them. No. You're right about that. But here, if we restart the game, since this is a cartridge, we could restart it instantly. No Red Baron yet, but we can go to Paris. And there's your Eiffel Tower. There it, is. Uh, there it is. See if you can fly right underneath it. Fly right through the legs. Just don't crash into it because they don't like that sort of stuff. Kill us, Vic. This is some hairy stuff yeah, right here. Yeah, move it. Yeah, that's it. Get right down in the middle there. There you go. Let's look up and see if we can see it. Oh man, that gets the blood going right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I need a I need a heart pill now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> gotta go back. Gotta go back to yeah. the field and have a drink. Yeah, there it is. 
and brag, brag yes. everybody. So we flew through the legs of the Eiffel Tower, something that's frowned at nowadays. Yeah, they don't like that much. Anymore. If you uh, ever watch the old uh, Jerry Anderson uh, uh, marionette uh, movie called Thunderbird 6, uh, there's a scene where a uh, biplane with the puppets portraying the parts of humans hanging onto the wings and such flies under a, over, uh, a bridge overpass in England that was just made on like the M5 motorway or something like yeah. that. And that is not a model. That is a full-size like World War II biplane flying in between the ground and this overpass. And uh, Anderson's uh, film crew had to get permission from the uh, road department to do that stunt. The uh, lady who flew that airplane was the one who flew a similar plane in the uh, then recent movie, Those Magnificent Men and Their Flying Machines. Oh, yeah. And so they had a camera set up on each side of the underpass, so it shows the plane going under it and then coming back out from under it. And she did it twice. There was another one further down the road. They didn't, uh, or she looped around and came back and did it again. They only had permission to do it once. So the uh, Highway Commission was uh, quite miffed with them for doing that. When they first opened the Mackinac Bridge, there were a couple of guys who decided that they wanted to do that. And um, they did, and um, they got caught. And so the next guy that did it, I blanked out the numbers on his plane mm -hmm. and um, and did it. And they couldn't exactly tell who it was, uh, so they scrambled a, um, uh, a jet from Sawyer Air Force Base. And this guy was flying a very slow plane. He was headed back down mm -hmm. to the state. They, they uh, scrambled his jet, and his jet followed him all the way back down, down the state to see who he was. And when he landed, uh, they contacted the airport and found out who it was. But, People won't do that anymore. Yeah. The, the, uh, the penalty is losing your, your license. So, um, I, think, I think the penalty is losing your oh. license flying, any, uh, flying under any Okay, place. that's flak being shot at us, those red flares, because yeah. we were flying over the uh, German airfield there. Does it by any chance give you a damage report anywhere? Is there a way to look up your damage? Yeah, uh, Pointed straight down like that, yeah. and you see the smoke coming out, then you're then pretty you're much damaged. Yeah. Uh, no, as hit, you know? if you successfully land back at your airport and can taxi back to your hangar, uh, landing near your hangar refuels and rearms your SPAD, repairs damage you may have sustained, and lets the Germans repair their hangars if you have bombed them. Yeah, there's the map, there's the river. There's the German airfield. So let's try. Theoretically, you could land at a German airfield, couldn't you? Uh, you can. Sometimes you get shot down. Your aircraft gets damaged. Uh, you're better off landing on your own airfield. Oh yeah. You're better off landing behind French lines. Uh, if you land behind German lines, you have to try to escape. You gonna go back and bomb them there, Vic? Yeah. You can also bomb your own airport, but they discourage that. I think I overshot him a bit here. Let's go down a little lower. Yeah, they are. No, that's the, that's the airfield. Hmm? Well, that's their airfield. Yeah. Uh, we're getting a little flack here. They will not appreciate you coming in to bomb them. Probably fine. That's interesting. They're funny that way. Did you do it? It. it takes a little practice, they say in the instructions, to, uh, I'm waiting for the uh, airfield to come up there. Where's the hangars, darn it? Right below oh, there, there. If you look down, you'll see them. Come on. That's an old plane. I'll try dropping a bomb. Don't drop it while you're inverted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that the bomb? I don't know what that's flat. Oh that's, that's a your uh, shadow, you're about to be dead. Yeah, that's our shadow there. 
And that's what happens when you do a one-point landing yeah. <laughs> on your uh, propeller. Yeah. Hang no on. hangers, no balloons, no plane shot down crash. Press S to start. Uh, let's go over the, French, the trenches with the Red Baron. So hitting the P button for pan. This is pretty quick. I don't know when he's going to show up. Yes, that cross purpose of the, uh, is uh, your shadow. Yeah. Uh, so if we look down. I think you can only drop a bomb. I do have bombs, don't I? How many bombs do you get with all these things? Five. Can't be too many. You got four guns? Yeah. yeah. Somewhere. I haven't fired them yet, have I? There you go. Don't waste ammo. You're going to need every bit. Yeah, I think you have a thousand rounds, which is good for a hundred bursts. Each burst, you know, fires ten rounds. Mm. They fire your propeller blades? Yeah, they're synchronized to the uh, prop yeah. rotation. The, uh, which took a little while to do because the first guys that tried that shot their own propellers. Yeah, yeah. They done, they didn't like that. Then they tried covering the backside of the propeller with metal plates, but they figured bouncing the bullets off of that was a poor yeah. thing to do. Uh, yeah, this has uh, two uh, machine guns. It's an upgrade over the previous model, the SPAD-7, which had one machine gun. In, uh, in, the, in the First World War, uh, the first guy that shot at the other plane was considered a very bad sport until, uh, until they shot back, in which case they said, well, all right, you know, now we better start arming. And they had a machine gun in the, in the uh, uh, back seat, um, which <laughs> quite often shot its own tail off until they, they put a, a stop in there so that you couldn't swing it back and shoot directly yeah. Right. yeah, the original stops were mechanical and you couldn't physically move the gun where the tail was. You had to raise it up over the tail and then drop it okay. down. And as gunners were traversing an enemy plane, they had to take so much time to actually move the aim of the gun. Uh, the Mark II version was they had a device that disabled the trigger. So the, the gunner could just keep the gun at the same level, but it just wouldn't fire when it was pointed at their own tail. And that made uh, tracking the uh, enemy target much better. Yeah. Aerial warfare in the First World War was a really odd thing. Hmm. Um, done you know, four or 500 feet above the ground, so if you were if you're in trouble, you had no place to land. You had yeah. no, no place to glide. And uh, guys would, uh, guys would often, uh, no, uh, the Americans were not issued parachutes because the American government did not believe in parachutes. They did not think the parachutes would work. The French and the British got parachutes, so if they got in trouble, they could bail out, but Americans could not. They had to try and land. And uh, just throttle down a bit. Plane, uh, it kind of focuses your attention, so it makes it landing a little harder. Yeah, there's the enemy trenches there. It's easier to bomb them if you fly parallel to them, but of course the trenches yeah. aren't parallel. So. Uh, the red flash there, we're picking up some flak. So who else, who else grew up watching a classic TV series called 12 O'Clock High? Oh, yeah. About I've the British uh, uh, bomber uh, crew. Oh, that was American crew. That was, oh, Greg, Gregory Peck was in the uh, movie. I don't know about yeah, the yeah. TV series. Yeah, you're right. I think it was a uh, American crew. Now, I can't seem to figure out how to... Uh... Raise the bones? No, how to drop a bomb. I don't know if uh, I dropped Is this a, a shadow here? Yeah, uh, a shadow. Is that a plane? Uh, no, that's another aircraft. I 
was going to say, don't shoot at your own shadow because then you'd be diving at it. Uh -huh. It's an awful lot like our shadow. Me and my shadow. There's a way of looking forward. Front, left, right, back, up, down, down, up, up. There's a tree. What's your altitude right now? We are oh. scraping it. At 100 feet? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll go to uh, 9, which should give it full throttle. And, uh, yeah, we're only at about 100 feet. Yeah, if you can count the leaves on the tree, uh, you're probably a little <laughs> Okay, where's that there Red Baron? Well, he'll be behind you when he shows up. <laughs> Trust me, he has it. <laughs> He's good like that. You'll so, uh, you see the tracer fire uh, tearing up your wing. It was that same tree again. Are we going in circles? No, we're losing altitude a bit. Yeah, they recommend you climb to your cruising altitude and then throttle back a little and maintain it. Yeah. Uh, that altitude, no, not to run a full throttle all the time. How much fuel we got left? Uh, okay, empty is straight up, so we're uh, less than a quarter of a tank right now. Yeah. Let's just land at the German field and see if they've got a few liters and we'll get us back to uh, mm -hmm. pretty good sports. Yes. There's actually a way of looking here. There, that's looking straight ahead. Oh, that is is uh, uh, looking at your aircraft from a distance. That's cool. Yeah. And uh, so let's, uh, yeah, here I can give it up elevator, some down, left. Let's give it a little more throttle. So every time you maneuver, you lose altitude. I don't know how they determine what uh, what position you see your aircraft, if you're always looking north and you see it then or not. Well, that's why you look for the sun. Okay, well, some I'll keep banking some more. Yeah, and they put some clues in there, like the clouds in the sky. There's a compass in there, too, is there not? Yeah, yeah. There you go. There's your compass. We're still banking. So I wanted to change direction. So yeah, if you want to go low and slow, you can. Uh, the uh, uh, Dave Wakely tried going as high as he could, and he was suffering from hypoxia. Uh, he saw the Snoopy on his doghouse flying around, and he was getting real dizzy, so he had to descend. I'm not making this up. Oh, I know. <laughs> this is in uh, Spad Adventure number nine uh, that was published in the Chicago Times. It had to be back in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, I think it was 91. Yeah. So the uh, second upload I did after uh, I uploaded the operating manuals for Red Baron and for Spad 13 and Spad 13 Mark II is this is something that hasn't been seen since 1990. It's a copy of the page of Spad Adventures by Dave Wakely from the Chicago Times. And this is episode number one, The Shakedown Flight. Well, no, oh, you want me to read this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you gotta give me the mic. Yeah. So put on your... Okay, this is our this lavalier is mic that... that uh, yeah. This is the device that uh, made it a little bit better uh, audio. Now, I've got to, before I put this on, I just realized, looking at it, that we don't have the wind uh, thingy on there. Well, don't talk directly at it, and you won't pop your peas. Okay? No. Uh, a lot of peas. Well, let's, <laughs> let's see if I can find it. Uh, it's in the bag somewhere, I hope, because it started out in the bag. Yeah. I might as well announce on a public forum like oh, here this. We go that uh, I uh, sent an email to my supervisor at work, but not to Human Resources, that as of uh, May 22nd, I plan on retiring from working. And uh, I have a uh, small pension, 
And uh, between that and Social Security, uh, I plan on not having to go into work anymore. Although my wife has a honeydew list, yay long. <laughs> yeah, work, not working is not exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's not going to work for something it's not else. Going, it's not going to live the life of the year. Uh -huh. Well, finally found it, got all the pieces. Um, in case you couldn't hear that, because this is a fairly close talking mic, um, Vic announced that he is retiring at the uh, uh, the end of um, May of this year and will be um, carrying on working not for money but for uh, his significant other. So, at any rate, uh, Vic wants me to read the um, uh, spot number one. Uh, spot, adventure, so spot adventure number one. Best, uh, so I'm going to. Oh yeah, my TV announcer voice. Yeah. Yes. Well, I have a I have a uh, a TV voice and a, a radio face, so uh, that's that's why I'm not still in that business. Okay. Well, All right. That, I'll uh, be putting uh, the uh, Barry Traver uh, Genial Traveler collection on this flash drive. Okay. So. Uh, in case again you couldn't hear that, that's uh, Vic going to be uh, putting the Barry Traver thing on. I want to do the French field. Okay. And so we'll read along. Okay, the Shakedown Flight. This is written by Dave Wakely. Uh, it's a perfect day for flying. The sun is blazing, the sky is blue, and come to think of it, the ground is blue too. Can I have but no read, matter. Uh, red book on the inside of the cover. It's a red book. It's oh, cover. yeah. Okay. It says Red Venom. There we go. Because that's the first okay. line. That's the, the manual. At any rate, start up, or rather boot up, by placing your SPOD 13 disc in drive one and selecting extended basic. Well, there you go. I think you've already got that. If you're flying the Mark II version, choose N to the Red Baron option, since it's not a good idea to fight before you know how to fly. Uh, I think that's pretty good advice. It's always a good idea to check out your plane before flying, just to make sure the ground crew hasn't left any critical parts in the hangar. Look at the instrument panel in front of you. The best way to interpret this is to open the SPOD manual and set it up so you know what you're doing. You will discover that if you open the manual to the middle page and turn it sideways, you can put the keyboard template flat on top of the TI for a console, and then the instrument panel page will sit upright up against the PE box or the bottom of the monitor. Make the necessary adjustments so the page stays open, and be sure you don't block any of the viewing area of the screen. The top dial, the compass, should read straight north. The bottom dial, the fuel gauge, should point to about 10 o'clock, which indicates a full tank. Both the altitude indicator on the left and the airspeed indicator on the right should be pointing straight up to zero. If you look over your right wing by pressing the three key, you should see the hangar. Return to a forward view by pressing the one key. Now check out the ailerons. Press the S key and the stick should move to the left. If you let it, if you let up and the stick doesn't return to the center, press the D key to recenter it. Now do the same for right aileron. The other stick positions will move the elevators or a combination of aileron and elevator. Check them out too. Then turn around and look at your tail. The, play, the planes, not your, the planes, not your own, it says. It is later on we'll be flying by the seat of our pants. Do this by first pressing the four key. Now press the, what is it, left or a less than sign and the greater sign keys and check out the rudder movement. No rudder movement? That's correct. The keyboard indicates those keys, but you never see the rudder actually move. This completes the functions of the plans we can view from here. In the future, when I refer to the pre-flight checkout, the above is what I mean. One of the complaints I've heard about SPOD is how difficult it is to find the various graphics objects on the ground. Today, we're going to take a fairly lengthy flight to show you how to find those things. I have taken this trip three different times, and it will take about 40 to 45 minutes in all. So, allot your time accordingly. I will, are we really going to do this for 45 minutes? <laughs> I will also be demonstrating how easy it is, how easy the spot is to fly. Did everything check out okay? 
And here we go. Well, when you went through flight school, how long did you spend in the airplane before they gave you a pilot's license? Uh, well, in those days... A more than 45 minutes? <laughs> yeah. In those days, pilot training was uh, about 20 hours, and then you were allowed to solo if they thought you could do it. Um, the now and then, yeah. Then you had to do another 40 hours to get a private pilot's license, I believe. Um, and of course, you couldn't crash in between that time. So, so here we go again. Hold down the eight key, which is the throttle up control. Watch as the on-screen throttle, which is below and to the left of the instrument panel, steps up to 100 RPM. Oh, steps up in 100 RPM increments. And listen as you hear the engine rev up to its top end of 1200 RPM. When the airspeed indicator reaches, um, hmm, this seems a little odd. When the, oh, I see, when the airspeed indicator reaches 100 miles per hour, Pull back on the stick, the X key, once. In Mark II, you will hear a beep when speed reaches 100, and the stick will automatically center itself when you let up on the X key. If your version doesn't do this, take appropriate action. What would appropriate action be? Send it back to the manufacturer? I don't know. Um, press, oh, maybe this is going to tell us. Press key 4 and watch, and watch the runway receding in the distance behind you. When the tall plane, when the tall plane, that is the tail wing and not the upright rudder, appears to clear the end of the, that should be tail plane, but it's listed here as tail, oh, tall plane. Well, all right, that's a typo. That is the tail wing and not the upright rudder, appears to clear the end of the runway, cut power by about two clicks by pressing the seven key twice. Now look forward by pressing the one. You're in a slow 300 foot per minute climb and your, and your current altitude should be around 400 feet. When it reaches 1,000 feet, apply two more down clicks and you'll be at 800 RPM. Trust me, it says the gun sight crosshairs will oscillate some above and below the horizon of line, but it will eventually settle down on or very near it. Don't worry if it's off a little. Your airspeed should be about 110 miles per hour and you are in a reasonable stable level of flight. Congratulations on a fine takeoff. Now, there's, there's several more pages of this. Do we really want to read the mm -hmm. whole thing? Because it's going to take uh, half an hour to do so. There, there are so many pages of this. It's really neat. Yeah, now this is just the first episode. Uh, and Dave wrote these after uh, extensive experimentation um, with the game. He played it for hours upon hours, he told me. And um, he, uh, he got very good at this. He could... He could do all the uh, maneuvers. Mm -hmm. He could. Uh, he tried in in these ten episodes uh, that he wrote, each one being a num numerous pages long, uh, which we printed in the uh, Chicago Times, as we've told you. Um, he would do a, sp a specific thing. Sometimes he would go up and bomb the trenches. Sometimes he would show you how to do landings and takeoffs, uh, touch and goes, they're called. Uh, sometimes he would. Uh, do S turns. Sometimes he would uh, do barrel rolls. Uh, I think one of the episodes he flies through the legs of the uh, Eiffel Tower, uh, which we just showed you, and um, uh, did all kinds of different uh, interesting things. And, and um, uh, it's if you have your old copies of the uh, Chicago uh, TI Times, you will. Uh, uh, see that there's quite a few things that you can do with this game. Uh, you can land in no man's land. You can land behind the lines if you want to. Uh, you can um, uh, do all sorts of things that uh, you can do with a real aircraft, uh, some of which I don't think I would uh, recommend doing, um, like flying under bridges and, and things like that. But uh, you can do it on, uh, on this thing and there's no penalties, you won't lose your license. You might crash a few times, uh, but fortunately you can uh, restart and uh, there's no, uh, no real pain involved in the crash. So, um, what do you think, Vic? Are we uh, pretty much ready here? Or are you? Well, he's following around with what you're telling him to do, uh, which is like throttle up, turn around, head west, do this, do that, do everything else. He says, look down here. And he pretty much points out all the different scenery. A lot of people complain. 
there's no scenery, there's nothing to see. You know, what do you do? Well, you got to go lower and you got to understand what those images you see oh, yeah. on the screen are. <clears throat> but why don't you skip to Spad Adventure number two? First, count off how many pages are left of Spad Adventure one. Well, there's still, let's see, a total of one, two, three, four, four and a half, four and a half um, pages of. Uh, a now documentation start here. Adventure number two. What's the first thing he says? First thing is the case of the walking willow. By most, by now, most spot owners have probably taken off and fought the good fight in the skies. For many, as soon as the package was open, you chased the observation plane, planes and tried to shoot them down. Or if you have the Mark II version, taken on the Red Baron with possibly disastrous results. If after some of this, however, you may find yourself tiring of the game, quote unquote, aspects of Spot 13. There will probably come a time when some combat techniques will find their way into this series, but its real purpose is to explore the limits of the simulation, to find the undocumented and unknown, and in general to increase your enjoyment of this program. Last time we took a long initial flight to see some of what there is to see from the air and to demonstrate some very basic techniques. This time, we're going to stick closer to home while learning other basic maneuvers. And you may, as you may have figured out, this series is not meant to be read away from the computer. The best way to use it is in conjunction with the program itself. By booting up spot 13 and keeping this page right next to the keyboard, you'll be able to follow along as we take each flight. So, uh, this is the case of the walking willow. And um, I don't remember the full um, series here. I haven't seen it in, uh, what, close to 30 years? Um, although I have all of the back issues involved, and uh, I could, if I <laughs> if I chose, uh, go and hunt them all up. This morning I tried to hunt up just a speech synthesizer and was unsuccessful doing that in the hundreds of bits of TI stuff I have. So, I, I, I know where these magazines are, I know where all the, uh, the newsletters are, but um, finding the individual ones, I think this is, I think this is, uh, yeah, I did not uh, uh, know what actual issues. Um, I see names in here that I haven't seen in many years who were um, originally members of our group, and um, uh, we at one time had over 700 members in the Chicago TI user group, and it um, is much smaller now, of course, but uh, many of these people went on to careers in, uh, com in the computer field, and uh, some of them, believe it or not, are actually starting to come back. They're, they're dusting off their TIs, and uh, in some cases they've given it to their grandchildren. Uh, the um, there are, there's a more and more and more interest uh, in the TI as time goes by because this is a computer that is knowable, uh, unlike some of the uh, modern IBM and Macintosh and stuff. This computer is something where you can look under the hoods uh, and, and see what's going on. Uh, many of the modern computers, they don't want you to look under the hood. Uh, they don't want you to, to know anything about programming. All they want you to do is buy the latest version, or yeah. in some cases, rent the latest version of whatever it is they're selling. Yeah. Buy a John Deere farm tractor, and they don't want you working on it. That's it. They own that tractor you bought and paid for. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not yours to work on it. It's, like, only, your, uh, yeah. it's like your telephone. Uh, they tell you right up front, uh, you don't own your number. Uh, we're just letting you use it. And uh, if you want to, if you want to, um, take it somewhere else you have to get our permission or in the case of my rotary phone uh, my old rotary phone uh, they they tell me that I'm just leasing it uh, been paying to lease it for about 50 years now you know you think that yeah and uh, and if it breaks down they can't fix it so at any rate, at least your TI computer is probably still working if you're watching this show. Have you gotten to the paragraph yet where he says that 
everything I told you in Spand Adventures number one is wrong? <laughs> no, no, I haven't gotten to that place okay, yet. Okay, yeah, he will get to the point where he says, by now I'm sure you've noticed that all the instructions I've given you is wrong. No, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm, they can't hear you, I don't think. Uh... Oh, okay. I'll have to speak up then. In uh, Spand Adventure number two, he mentions that everything he told you to do in Spand Adventure number one is wrong. And so, uh, that, I thought he started off saying that. I'm sorry. This is a pretty close talking mic, so it has to be clipped yeah. under there. Uh, why don't you go to Spad Adventure number six? And he has an interview with the owner of Not Poly Optics and has the history of uh, Red Baron. Okay. Is it number six or number six? It's not numbered. It's the one you'll get to that doesn't have a Spad Adventure number such and such. Okay, well, we're... And it's we're, the one where you see the typical question and answer format. Here's number Here's number six, No Man's Land, so we'll okay, no, go, go past that. Um, and we're still looking for the... Yeah, it's one that's not numbered. One that's not numbered. This is number seven, so we'll continue on. Okay. Uh... Number eight is numbered. Number nine oh, to the man. Uh oh. Here's the crash. Whoops. In uh, in number nine, he talks wait, about. Uh, he says, "Wait a minute. I'm in 19,000 feet now. Uh oh. Wait a oh, minute. I'm losing things." Yeah. He took the aircraft too high. He actually wanted to challenge the printed specs of this aircraft that could fly to 21,000 feet. Hmm. I think this is before they invented oxygen. Well, I'm not sure they ever invented oxygen, but... Um, I was being sarcastic. Oh, okay. Uh, I can't find the... Uh, There's one you'll see it has got a question and answer for me. Adam. I don't see that. Maybe that's further up here. Oh, we'll, here's uh, the specs. The uh, SPAD 13 is manufactured in French by the company SPAD. The engine's the Hispano Suiza 8BEC, eight cylinder liquid cooled V8 uh, of uh, 235 horsepower. Uh, wingspan 26 feet 11 inches, length 20 feet 8 inches. The weight 18,000 pounds fully loaded. Maximum speed 139 miles an hour. Uh, you can hit 150 in a dive. The ceiling is 21,800 feet, fuel endurance two hours, armament two fixed Vickers machine guns. Okay, I finally, oh, finally found the uh, interview, and um, it uh, is presented as an interview. However, Dave actually wrote it, uh, wrote to uh, the uh, author of this program, and... Um, it is, let's see, anybody remember who the author is? Yeah, uh, Dave, uh, uh, what's the guy being interviewed? The first paragraph, Well, he's asked who wrote it, and he said oh, it was my Gene brother. Harter, yeah, Gene, Gene Harter, Harter. Okay, yeah. is the uh, interview. So, um, Dave, Dave wrote and said, who wrote Spot 13? How long did this program ever take, and what problems were encountered? Hal, if and, you, uh, you and James want, you can do it. You read the one part, and he reads the other parts. We have a different voice. Okay, the problem here is with the microphone. Yeah, you got um, hand it back. Yeah, we got to hand it back and forth. So okay. let me just, I'll just do this. It's only one page here. Um, Dave wrote, uh, all right, Gene replies, Spot 13 was written by my brother David with some assistance from me. He was born, by the way, in Chicago while our family was living in Des Plaines. If you want to write him, he lives at... And here's the address, I don't think. Go ahead and write him. Okay, it's 416 High Street, Chesterton, uh, Maryland, 21620. So, uh, if he's still at the address and you still want to get some more information from the horse's mouth, as it were, by all means, write him at that address. Um, so then, um, Spot took about eight months to write, he says. Soon after we released the original version, David discovered graphic algorithms that would make Spot about twice as fast. Things often happen like this, he says. So we wrote, 
Mark II, which includes the new algorithms and some extra features, some of which were suggested by users. Yeah, can you get it in pink? Uh, will this, you know, can you put my name on it? Da, 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 da. Anyway, Dave then said, the viewing uh, area and spot is obviously clipped on the edges. Was this done as it appears to obtain or preserve an aspect ratio? Gene replies, the reason the screen is clipped is to decrease cycling speed. We estimate a 50% faster speed as a result. F-15 Strike Eagle for the PC cuts off half of the screen for the same reason. Dave then writes, both the sky and the ground in spot are blue. Why? Did some constraint in the computer dictate this? Gene replies, the greatest limitation of the graphics we found was that the TI doesn't have a true bitmap mode. That is, each bit does not have its own color, but is either on or off in the context of its byte, which can have only two colors. So whenever the program tries to write three different colors on a single byte, say a horizon line, a smoke line, and the blue sky, one of the colors is ignored, and the image drawn smears over that byte. That's why the ground is blue. If we had colored it in green, the smearing would have been unacceptably distracting. Of course, we use the bitmap mode that is available in order to get the 3D line perspective views. And I don't think going to monocolor would have helped. Dave then says, I was quite surprised and pleased to receive the Mark II version of SPOD uh, 13. Are further upgrades in the works now or planned? If so, is user feedback as to desired features wanted? Gene replies, as far as another update, there is no improvement planned as dramatic as the faster algorithm and Red Baron in Mark II. In memory restrictions, I would also, whoops, hmm, I think we lost the bottom of that page. Um, memory restrictions, something. Uh, it says, I will also urge, just urge everyone to send in their registration cards just in case. Also, for your information, SPOD is not a 32K program. It is actually over 40K using console memory and VDP RAM as well as the extended memory. Dave says, is there, is there a version of SPOD 13 planned specifically for the Myark 9640 computer? Gene replies, SPOD now works in the extended basic mode of the Myark 9640 but we don't plan on a version specifically for that computer unless we see a perfected version of the operating system and evidence that there are that more are being sold than at present. Dave says, one of the attractions of the Microsoft Flight Simulator is the undocumented features that the author, Bruce Artwick, put into the program. Are there any undocumented features of Spot 13, such as uncharted graphics, etc.? Gene replies, there are no undocumented features that I am at liberty to publicize. Uh -huh. Dave then goes on, how was a decision made as to what villages to place in the program? For example, why was Sasson included, but Bellow Woods and Chateau Thierry, where many Americans fought and died, left out? Gene replies, the French villages were chosen just as representative villages in the vicinity of Paris, caught up in the currents of the war. Dave is getting a little tedious at this point, don't you think? <laughs> Dave says, this one is half question, half suggestion. In the Microsoft FS, a number of scenery disks were begin are beginning to appear. That is, the programming for flight is independent of the programming for scenery. Is it possible, or how about, a system whereby new operational areas, quote unquote, are available, possibly as, quote, add-on, unquote, disks? The precedent for this exists, for example, with the TOD editor, whereby Tunnels of Doom owners can have new adventures with the same program. Jim replies, I like your idea for user-created scenery. Maybe a user-created airplane, too. Dave says, where did the name, not polyoptics, come from and what does it mean? Ah, Gene says, we bought a 99.4 in 1980, choosing it over the Apple II, mostly because it had better graphic and sound capabilities. Being programmers and game designers, it was a short step to forming our own company, called not, poly, not polyoptics, because one of the partners didn't like the name polyoptics. <laughs> and thus, we became one of the first companies to support the TI. 
Through the years, we have seen other companies come and go. We have seen advertising possibilities dwindle. And we have seen the TI market survive the most virulent blows and continue to survive. We still sell more than 20 games and simulations for the TI, though in the past year and a half, our sales of older games have dwindled. Some of our new extended basic programs, such as Laser Tank, Tower, and NORAD, really show off some of the capabilities of the TI, but we have found it very difficult to get out the word to the TI community. Even Spot has not sold as well as we had expected. We appreciate your efforts to publicize Spot and look forward to seeing future installments of the adventures. So, that was the interview that Dave Wakely uh, uh, conducted by mail, actually, uh, since email wasn't uh, what it is today. Conducted by mail uh, with uh, Gene Harder, the, uh, the author uh, and owner of uh, Not Polyoptics. And he's also explained the name. Uh, which is something I'd wondered about for many years. Yes, yes. At any rate, uh, Vic, are you ready to uh, show us something here? Or, so uh, we are, I, I, was, I was trying to see if we could... Uh, I'll turn this over to Owen. Okay. If I can get it off for me. Yeah, I'm trying to see if we can hit the ceiling. So we've been climbing steadily for the last 10 minutes. And right now it looks like we're at about 16,600 feet. And we're trying to continue to go up. The thing is, the higher your altitude gets, the more difficult it is to gain altitude. So I'm starting to notice you have to continuously uh, aim your plane upward and then let it catch up. Otherwise, you'll stall. Um, yeah, and you're at full throttle there. You're at full throttle. So if you, if you just let it sit, it'll. right now it's just staying right at horizon level, just yeah. slightly above. So in order to climb with any kind of speed, you have to tilt the nose upward and then yeah. hopefully you don't stall. Yeah, I think in Adventure 9 there, he talks about trying to reach the uh, altitude limit and uh, the tricks he has to do to do that. Yeah. Um, it says, sigh. You know, this is almost getting boring now that it looks like I haven't attracted a lot of attention. Not only is it getting boring, but it may be stupid too. For all I can see, there might be 550,000 soldiers down there slugging out in hand to hand for all I can spot. I would be able to see if Jerry were moving a large number of artillery pieces, wouldn't I? Isn't that the point of all this? And then he says, over 19,000 feet now, and this is as far east as I'm going. For all I know, I'm over Berlin. A nice hard right bank ought to do it. There we go, straight west. That should do it, if the instruments are still working. Why do I keep worrying about the instruments? Wait, what the hell is that straight ahead? It looks like, it couldn't be, it is. It's a dog flying like a, looks like a beagle, wearing a leather jacket and a silk scarf, flying a doghouse. <laughs> no, wait a minute. I'm hallucinating now, lack of oxygen. At least I hope so. He seems to be gone, but he waved goodbye before he disappeared. Wordsville. I just wish I could see something, anything down there. Spod note, even the perspective lines in Spod 13 Mark II disappear above 18,000 feet or so. Oops, I'm at 20,000 feet. Now I'm either going to set a new altitude record, pass out or both. Let's see, discretion is the better part of valor. Isn't that how it gets? <laughs> Calls for drastic action, time to power down, it says. And to heck with the rest of the mission. Yeah, we're uh, right now. I'm losing altitude. I was at 18.6, and all of a sudden we stalled. So I'm gonna try it again. Now the good thing is, he says that um, if you run out of gas, you should be able to glide for quite a while. Uh, As you can see on the bottom dial, we're at less than half a tank now. The uh, the top line on that bottom dial represents full and empty, so it rotates counterclockwise. Full is straight up and down, three quarters is not at nine o'clock, half, uh, half a tank is at six o'clock, one quarter tank is at three o'clock, so we're between a half and a quarter tank right now. And we are at back up at 16, eight, or 18, eight right now. And I'm really having to struggle to keep that horizon below, uh, below the sights there and if it if it's if it goes above the sights you're losing altitude yeah i thought in that one article it might say the tricks 
like I thought in that one article you just read, Hal, that he had a trick on playing with the uh, elevator uh, to keep climbing at this point. Yeah, right here, we're, I'm having a very, very hard time getting any more altitude. We've been sitting between 17 and 18.5 for a couple of minutes now. We're just about to go over 19,000, though, if I can just keep this up a little longer before it stalls. Oh, they're stalled again. See that? Yeah, well, the air gets thinner up here, so it's harder for yeah. the engine to uh, uh, to get some uh, grip on. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, naturally carbureted. <coughs> I think it's naturally aspirated. No turbo or supercharger. No. So you don't get to cheat. Mm. And besides, you can't breathe that high anyway, mm -hmm. so... We're at 18.9. I just want to get to 19,000. Yeah, now if they only had the screen there we flicker go. and did have the Snoopy's doghouse fly by. Yeah. <laughs> I said there's 18,000 feet going by. Goodbye, 18. Hello, 19. Sounds like the lyrics to a song. Say, am I getting silly or what? There's a war on and I don't know where I am. Why can't I take this seriously? Hmm. Uh oh, 18,500 feet, and I'm down to a quarter of a tank of gas. Uh, does that sound familiar? I'm actually at 20,000, and I'm at about 28% of fuel left. So I'm at 20,400 right now and still climbing. Ooh. I think I figured out the trick here. You you have to you have to kind of do it in pulses. You have to you have to tilt the plane upward in pulses. If you try to do it for more than just a second, you'll stall. Mm -hmm. And if you just let it go, you just, you're losing altitude. So you have to do it in pulses. So I'm at 20,600 20, feet right now. Oh, now I'm dropping again. It definitely gets more difficult at this altitude. And I'm stalling. There you go. I'm stalling, falling towards the earth and back down to 20,200. I may have I may have found the ceiling here, guys. <laughs> but have you found the red baron? Nope. I I turned him off for this. Oh, this okay. Machine. Not only that, but the red baron would be probably very silly to be flying up at twenty thousand feet. He uh, he wouldn't be able to uh, find much competition up there. And his job, of course, is to shut down and shoot down uh, the enemy aircraft. So you got to go where they are. It's like Willie Sutton, when they used to ask him why he robbed banks, he said, well, because that's where the money <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why this guy? Oh, close to 21,000. I think I'm already at. I'm at 21, I'm at 22,000. Okay, so I'm at 22,000 feet right now. 22,000 feet. This shouldn't be possible, according to the schematics. Uh, what did I say the altitude was? was and there I'm 21? going barreling downward again. Uh, yeah, it... Maybe that there is no upper limit. Uh, Twenty-one eight hundred is the uh, okay. So I just so, so I, you just set a record. All right. Um, I wonder what the airspeed would be if you if you dove. Probably you could get up to the point where the wings would blow off. Yeah, I'm uh, worried about the wings coming off on this if you I do a power dive. Just. I'm technically right now going seventy miles an hour at this altitude. It hmm. stalls at 40. It, um, and I'm stalling out again. Oh, man. I hit 22,500 and I stalled out. Okay. Well, That's it. I can't get over 22,500. Disturbing that discovery here on some of the discs. Uh, uh, some of these... Uh, my disturbing discovery here. Some of these cartridges, uh, USB drives I gave out at the fair, uh, do not have Barry Travers, Genial Traveler's uh, library on it. So I'm going to have to uh, make sure I have that on the uh, 2019 uh, USB drive. Darn. Okay, well, if you want to demonstrate something else here than SPAD 13, shut this off, hook up the uh, compact flash. And uh, what was it that uh, we said that uh, Peg Jump was on? Uh, Genial Traveler 111? Um, 311, I think. Was uh, 311. It? Let me find out. Okay, so we're turning on the compact flash. Got Rich Extended Basic loaded in. Uh, we'll go to two, go to disc three. 
on the compact flash, which has my utility programs. 311, yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, file utilities, two volume utilities. Uh, let's uh, catalog uh, 100. Do you know Traveler 20 uh, list? We gotta do a list on this compact flash card. These are all my modules, libraries, discs that were uh, given away at the fair. I think it was quite a few uh, floppy disks of uh, modules on disk. Uh, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry's 18, 311, huh? Oh 311. boy. I can't make heads or tails out of this. Is which one's called what? That I don't know. GT. Ah, uh, uh, there we go. GT242526. GT31 side one. That's probably it, GT31. Okay, so we're at uh, volumes 142 and 143. Okay. There's no good way to exit out of that program except for turning the computer off. Uh, let's do this in caps. We're going to call the floppy that's in drive one. Who's that? Four what? One four two or one four three? Four two. Okay, so we'll put one four two okay? in that, and then we'll do a call. Cool. Unmount. Get into our RXB utilities, do D for a directory, disk one. Oh, pig jumps there. Pig jump source. Archie, Archie Duck, how's that? Jump a peg, IV two fifty four. Yeah. So uh, I can't recommend uh, Rich uh, Gilbertson's Rich GKXB on cartridge enough. Uh, it has a bunch of utilities put in, disk directory, mm -hmm. stuff like that, and uh, copy, load, run. There we go. Uh, this has also reached, uh, had some chatter on the uh, TI-99ers uh, Facebook page. And uh, so here it is, is a jump a peg. Now, he had mentioned that it was possibly copy protected here. Well, I just did a break. And we can list it. So is, this is not the one with the notorious copy protection that uh, would not let you break it and list it. I did just receive a message from... Waleed? No. At the TI game shelf? Where is it? Okay. Jump a peg. Copyright 1990 by Barry Traver. You know, I saw him do his Coney Games demonstration at the 1990 Chicago TI Fair at the Holiday Inn. And uh, it was great. I had literally a front row seat and I had my cassette recorder. And I was recording his demonstrations as he went through the jump a peg, uh, as he did all the Coney, which he mentioned were con games, where the operator gains your confidence and then gets you to wager on it. And just when you think you got the game, he always throws a ringer. There's always some reason why the mark is the customer's cold, uh, will not rank, win. So Jump a Peg is a classic solitaire game dating back to the early uh, 1700s. It's also currently at every Cracker Barrel chain restaurant yep. in the country. Cracker Barrel is conveniently located on uh, superhighway exits. And uh, on every table, they've got what uh, kids played with before Nintendo, which is a triangular version of the Jump a Peg. Uh, on the TI world, I think there's one that's a, a cross-shaped one. Uh, I've looked for variations of this, 
And uh, maybe we can do that at another meeting, to try to find all the variations of jump a peg. But this is the one that was talked about recently. So a peg can jump over an adjacent peg to an empty hole beyond, and the peg it jumped over is removed. Only horizontal or vertical moves are allowed. Many goals are possible, but the most frequent one is to have just one peg left, occupying the very, oh, occupying the very center of the board, not asking for too much, one left. And it's got, oh, by the way, it's got to be in the middle of the board, too, while you're at it. Uh, Cracker Barrel gives you a score on their wooden uh, physical peg jump uh, game of um, your uh, relative uh, intelligence based on how many pegs you've left on it, whether it's half the pegs on the playing field or not. Owner, James, you want to take over here? I have to go feed a parking meter now. Oh, I don't know what to do at this point. But... Well, you can jump a peg. Yes. Yeah, let me go. Go ahead. I have to share this uh, the hot seat with everybody so I can hell reading span 13. Sure. Yeah, because everybody knows I don't know damn thing about computers. <laughs> every, every demo I've ever tried to do has been. Oh, you've well, got such a rich announcer's voice. Like oh, Bob that's Cardo it. There. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, okay, time to press the any key to continue. Oh, Remind me, I have to pay you for that. Uh... Okay, so we've got a. What would you like as your starting position? And we have a rather lengthy menu of options to choose from. They're so good though, Al. They just melt. So let me try. Try P. P? I'm not sure, let me look. <laughs> I'm not sure, let me look. Okay, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. English traditional, so we've got our cross, Latin cross, Greek cross, fireplace. So I guess these are starting positions, is this what it said, or is this how we have to Those will be configure your, it? Your designs. Yeah. Jefferson pyramid. Jeff's pyramid. pyramid. Yeah, it's closer to what. Tiffany Lamp. Tilted Square, Pentagon, Davis Jump. That, that it's looks. Kind of all, yeah. yeah. So like, good luck, you've got one space to put, to work with. Uh, oh, yeah. Another one. Eek. Okay, so we're back to the beginning. Press enter yeah, to select. Like it's got the, the center, the center <laughs> hole empty. So that would present, I would think, the most the most opportunities to put things there. You can go from you know diagonals, or you can go from eight, what is it, eight different well, positions. Right, you just have to figure out how to march every peg out through that yeah. hole through that you know, hole as the hole you know moves as you jump pegs. Yeah. Okay. What would you like as your ending position? Oh boy! I think I just chose the, I chose the one I didn't want by it by exiting out. Be yeah. Supine, uh, Traditional. Totally asleep. Yeah. Square. Pinwheel. Yeah, not. So good. Traditional. Show a solution. Oh, Will it actually go through and show oh, us? Yeah. Show a solution. Okay. 
So it's going through and it's solving the puzzle for us. There we go. When it comes back, let's just tell Vic that... Uh, hey, I did it. We, we, were, uh, we, <laughs> we did it. It was yeah, a we're, group we're, effort. We're at genius level. Yeah. So, so key user inputs here would be which which peg are you wanting yeah. to jump and where you wanted to jump to. Okay. Yeah, so it looks like 46 jumps, 44, blah, blah, blah. And it just, you know, peg of origin versus the peg you want to jump, I guess. Kind of like chess, where uh, you're describing the uh, the pieces that relative relative to one another, right? Oh, there you go. See, that was easy. And yeah. Yeah. I, Nothing to it. Let me let me get a, a notebook and write this down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Vic would already have have noted that in his yeah. book by now. <laughs> One in 18 moves. One in 18 moves. That was too easy. with F there. Okay, because it's more like the traditional ones we've seen. Yeah. Okay, show a solution. No, I guess the idea is to remove all but one. And I don't think there's any ending ending right. configuration. Hmm. That's pretty good. Wait, how did it get into the center by itself? From 45 to 44. <laughs> there was one at 46. Was there? 46 jumped 45. Oh, and I didn't see that. That's pretty clever. Yeah, well, we'll tell Vic that uh, we get two of them in the minimum number of moves, and the game is really kind of too easy. The simplest looking one of the lot. Huh. I see how this is going to work. Yeah, there it goes. Yeah. Yeah, so it looks like it's still all kind of trying to finish in the, with a uh, peg in the center position. Yeah. yeah. yeah makes sense. Oh, so we won three of them already. <laughs> not a challenge. Yeah, not a challenge at all. Not a challenge when you have the TI to help you along. Yeah, right. It's smarter than we are. Oh, you missed, you missed it. We did three in the minimum moves. Uh, Jim is really good at that. <laughs> Do another one, Jesse. Show them how brilliant you are. Yeah. Well, this has all the solutions. It has, it has all that. Uh, watch this. You can, Piece of cake. You can, you can do this so how do you play this? <laughs> well, this is very interesting to watch it. This is almost as good as zero Z. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you remember, I did the uh, uh, move a square uh, puzzles, the sliding block puzzles. Oh, those are kind of tough uh, some compared years to this. Yeah. And you move the square from the upper left corner to the lower right. Everybody says, I could do that in about 20 moves. And 87 moves later, yeah. it has solved the puzzle for you. Yeah. Well, we're getting close to the solution here. Uh, Barry had a uh, one where you could see the pieces move. See that? And he says, uh, one again. how did I get uh, 30 sprites on the screen at one time? It was a different game than this. He said the solution was is those are all graphics. And when you want to move a piece, he draws a sprite in that location, deletes the graphic, slides the sprite across the screen, draws another graphic underneath it, yeah. and then deletes the sprite. And uh, normally I would have thought of Smart. having uh, every uh, graphic on there being a sprite. And you couldn't tell it uh, was taking the time to do that. Right. Sorry, they were stuck together. I touched them. I had to take. Yeah, them. well, that's both. that's the rule of Malamar. Sometimes you got to you got to jump on the grenade for the tape. Yeah. Otherwise, you might tear the one on behind it. Yeah, I tore up one uh, trying to do it, and it, it convinced me that uh, 
if it gives, if, 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 uh, no, not in my car. I went to Best Buy. They didn't have it. Went to Walmart. They didn't have it. How many do you want? I need one know. four foot S video cable to go from my TI output to my uh, adapter. Going I do my have S video cables at home if you feel like you want to drive into the city specifically for it. Yeah. Northwest side. Northwest. Yeah. So in other words, you would basically. Down, yeah. Down the, you know where the uh, Kennedy and Edens uh, merge is. It's about a ten okay. minute drive. Yeah. Ten minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, you want to ride home? Sure. <laughs> there you go. That done. Piece, that piece drive to St. Charles. <laughs> done. Yeah, I get, I'll do that, and then I got a three-hour drive to the house. Okay. One in six moves. Wow. Well, I'll be right back. I'm 94, so it'll be straight, you yeah. know, straight up anyway. Yeah. Um, and I'm so. right there by the split, so no yeah. big deal for him to get back well, from six there. There's watching now. Is there anything? Can we actually play a game, or was it? I'm letting, I'm letting the TI play the game, because yeah. between working all night long and sleep getting catnaps on the uh, office couch, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then running back home to get stuff, and then running out here, it's like, I, this would end up being a, d a demonstration of how mentally impaired I am right now. <laughs> Okay, so this is the... Uh, we want them all. On so. uh, that other screen, what's the next screen? What okay. is the space bar? So uh, it's, it gives so us the option. So starting position. Yeah. Right. Okay. Look at this. Cool. Uh, and we can... I had done a video I found online of Hunt the Wumpus in mm. Minecraft. Really? And the guy must have actually plotted it on a real three-dimensional dodecahedron. Because it wasn't just a doorway here and a doorway there, somewhere like up in the ceiling or down in the floor. Wait, there, wait, wait there's hump, there's hump and Opus on Minecraft? Uh, yeah, it was a video I had seen on the YouTube, and he showed how he had that game and he was playing it. I don't know. So I'm trying a couple it. different configurations, beginning, you know, beginning puzzles and ending positions. Some of those are impossible because... Uh, well, let's see what the uh, computer says about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is our starting position. Well, so that's the starting position. The other one it was showing was the ending position oh, yeah. win. Oh, yeah, that could do that. Yeah. Yeah. I can leave 40 or 50 of these things on, on uh, <laughs> place. That, that's not the part. These little triangle things from pouring it in. Yeah, I, I know. I've played with them many a time. I can leave five or six of those on, on line, uh, in place. Yeah. Because I'm dumb, dumb and nervous. Jerry loves it when I write them. Yeah. To do, it, to do it, to right. do it right. Ah, here we go. Right one time. Kicker life. That's how I handle peace movement in the game of U R. Or that's um, a um, sort of a pawn racing game from uh, ancient uh, Egypt, or at least speculatively. Yeah. Or, or was I have I have a I have a I have a copy of the game, not not for the T I, but for. Um, you know, an actual board game. And basically what it is is you have two areas of play and then a bottleneck, single, pa single oh. path between the two areas. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of move everything up. And I think it's a two-player game. Yeah. You the are. They have the, you uh, are. Game, uh, Darn, I can't remember the name of it, but it's like the oldest board game in the world. Uh, you're on the River Nile. You get in the river in the middle. And well, I think that's I, I think that's Ur. Then but. you hand, uh, go downstream, and whoever reaches like the downstream first is the winner. Right. I think that sounds kind of like the Ur game as well. Yeah, that you've be. got kind of that bottleneck scenario where you're right, right pushing in. pieces through it. In, uh, well, I mean, there's um, there's a guy that I think did a ton of research on that as well back in the day. And How did anything jump over anything? <laughs> Do you want to see again? Yeah. One in that, 21. That's oh, oh. That's, yeah. That's, yeah, but you got a dozen pieces left. Right. Yeah, that's right. That that means that you probably didn't play the game at its optimum level. Right. So I started with what was it? Oh, okay. So you don't have to have almost every right. square fill. 
Right. So I started with French traditional, which is everything but the center in that sort of configuration. And then I ended with a, uh, gee, I think it was 12, the 12 guards configuration. Totally. And, or I think the the apostles is what I was doing originally, oh, okay. but there are other configurations, you know, letter E that you can end in for oh, solving. Yeah, as usual, I'd be bringing. Okay, as usual, I uh, bring the disc down and I run it without running it at home and practicing. And right, and of course it'll show us the solution. You'll see it jump for multiple well, points. While Owen was doing span thirteen there. I was. Uh, actually copying uh, Harry Travers' uh, library, Junior Traveler's yeah. library over to the compact flash card. And that's where we're running it on, some yeah. special P-Box here. Right. And anybody at home, if uh, your uh, flash drive that you got at the fair uh, banquet doesn't have Barry Travers' Gino Traveler on it, uh, I missed. Oh, look. Yeah. And, uh, come next year. Either, yeah, come, yeah. either come next year or... 2019. Or, or cry all the way. Or <laughs> we'll find it elsewhere. That's right, yeah. Let's go it's TSVU. Yeah. You can go to Span 13 and Red Baron on next year's along yeah. with all these pages of docs and so Span Adventures. And if you didn't get, if you, if you didn't come to the fair, you didn't get one of these uh, modules and screw you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So how is this monitor working out for? It seems okay because you can got kind a of pretty wide uh, field of view. It doesn't blink out if you get off axis. Yeah, I can see that. If I'm sitting, you know, right in front of the keyboard, I can still see pretty much of the screen well, from the side angles. Some monitors are set up for an office with privacy, well, two degrees off, off center, center, and that's and it. Can't see what's on that thing. Yeah, they're highly polarized. Yeah. Oh, you can get a screen. I had a screen for a long time. Mm -hmm. It just fit over a regular monitor and. and uh, you had to be right in front of it, and uh, yeah. worked out, that worked out pretty yeah. well. Every time I go get my taxes done, that lady's got that thing, so I've got yeah. Yeah. to see what she's doing. Uh -huh. I had, uh, Take had, your camera on a tripod and just put it in between yeah. here. <laughs> there one that uh, saw one that was a like a mirror finish, mm -hmm. and if you moved any off to either, either side, just a few degrees, mm -hmm. it looked like a mirror. It, it, like those uh, yeah. sunglasses that you know, cops yeah. wear. And uh, that was nice. That, uh, that, then people would see themselves craning around to look at themselves, and they still couldn't see what was on the mm -hmm. screen. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how they did that. Well, they came up with that for airline travelers with their laptop. They said, does your uh, fellow passenger seem more interested in what's on your laptop than you are? Yeah. And there's a guy, you know, like a gooseneck, you know, looking at the other guy's screen. Well, that's why you don't want to show your homemade porno movies on the plane. Mm -hmm. uh, Indeed. That, you know, Especially if you're in the middle seat. In a program. Uh, well, maybe you want to share. Or maybe you do want to share. Yeah, maybe yeah. you do want to, you know, uh, invite people uh, to join whatever club it is you're in. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the, uh, so it's down to like two. Uh, <laughs> jump, jump again. Ta -da. Oh, it's the perfect win. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Got it. Okay, Vic, you want to come back to the hot seat and take oh, us okay. to the next? By the way, uh, or was a town in what is present-day Iraq. It was the oldest city uh, that they've ever been able to discover being a, a, a real city. And in German, Uralt means the, as old as you get, ancient. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, uh, they found, the, they found the, uh, the city, they found the remains of it. Mm -hmm. It was under sand for a long, long time. And they've begun to uh, dig it up now and, and uh, try and get some uh, insight into what life was like six, seven thousand mm -hmm. years ago. Okay. Uh, I find that, I find that fascinating, but... So does that mean we need to either find a copy of Ur for the TI or write a copy? Well, there we might, bring my, there might my be a seven thousand, yeah. Game in. There might be a seven thousand year old oh. prototype. Well, the they're, they're yeah. used mm -hmm. for museum replicas, though, and I bought one some years mm -hmm. ago. Um, someone's interpretation of you know how the game would be. And it's basically playing field in a box with all the little tokens. Is that the one where they uh, threw the sticks to determine how many uh, spaces you moved? It was a precursor to dice. Yeah, I'm, I forget. I forget too. I'm going to have to look that game up it's once I get home to it. It's been a while since I've had it out and played with it. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another reason to have uh, Barry Travers' uh, <coughs> collection is uh, BXB, XXB, 
uh, BXB is a very valuable program if uh, you tend to leave extended basic in all the time and try to run stuff you'll find basic only programs that call graphics character sets 15 and 16 and of course that crashes in extended basic because that's where it puts the sprite table what uh, BXB does is it redefines the sprite table back as a graphics program and you would call it it's a merge format program DV163 and you call call merge you know disk whatever BXB slash XXB and it would uh, merge BXB into your program so when it runs it uh, it redefines the sprite table back as graphics table and it runs and you don't have to manually like go back to basic and you know because you might have an auto loader or something RXB you know. has 15 and 16 too doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, we're cheating with that because it'll automatically do it. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, also Barry Traver had his uh, GC uh, for Graphic Comp. That's where he had discovered uh, compiling graphics commands uh, in extended basics so they run faster at assembly language speed. Uh, Bruce Harrison also did uh, Bruce Harrison's uh, compiled uh, graphics. Uh, too, and he ran a demonstration at one of our fairs uh, showing how much quicker it would show, like to draw a checkerboard on the screen, it'd take two and a half minutes uh, to draw that, and in Graphic Comp, uh, it took about four seconds. It was very good. What you got there? I am trying to show this uh, WHD Universal Drum ROM module board from 1994. Okay, so that like predates the. Uh, yeah, this is before the Gidry cart runs by mm -hmm. by uh, several years, mm -hmm. and um, without uh, jacking something up, I don't know how to get this zoomed. There it is, right there. <clears throat> so these came from your basement, there, Hal. Yeah, I was given those. Um, I can't remember who gave them to me, uh, but uh, I um, I wanted to pass them along to somebody who knows how to use them because they aren't doing any uh, any good. Aren't doing any good in, in, in my collection. Mm -hmm. So it looks like it takes two 74 AL uh, 161s, three, four, four 74 AL 161s, and then uh, two 7512 ROM and two 7512 ROM. Um, and it takes some resistor jumpers there and stuff like that. Um, I've not seen. I've not ever seen one like this before. Not one. Not one of these. I've not seen one of these. Before. Well, play with it a little bit. See what you can come up with. And uh, yeah. uh, Jim's working on some. And uh, okay. who knows? Who knows? Yeah, if you've got a project, something take a couple. Of yeah, I've got some. I got some stuff I can try on. There. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, just for laughs on my flash ROM. Uh, no, not my flash ROM. On my compact flash. Sidecar, I have BXB loaded there, uh, so it's always handy. So just an extended basic, I did merge disk 3 BXB and listed it. Well, the first thing is a number you can't type in, line zero. Uh, so the guarantees that BXB will be called as a subprogram before any of your program lines start, which you can only type in line one. You can't type in a line zero. Well, actually you can, but it's a trick. And uh, Perry Traver learned how to do that. How to make a program that writes a program. So here we get call BXB, call character, you know, this one. Then here, call BXB at line one. By John Benke, Stephen Shaw, improved by Richard Heath, scrunched by Jim Peterson. So here we get up to the actual program itself, line 30,000. If you remember on Jim Peterson's nuts and bolts discs, he had a whole bunch of subprograms numbered from like line 20,000, which is unlikely anybody would have a program with a line that high, to 30,000. And they were all in different numbers and they all uh, demonstrated different subprograms he had that did all the tough work. They did all the heavy lifting and you just uh, called them in. Yeah. Uh, we've demonstrated. Uh, uh, Jim's uh, from time to time. Yeah. Yes, uh, nuts and bolts discs from time to time. Always a good demo, though, because um, for people who like me aren't real programmers, mm -hmm. um, 
it's a marvelous thing to be able to uh, have something that you can just pick and choose and cherry pick mm -hmm. uh, and, and drop it into your program. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, here you see uh, call load such and such. And it, these are not blanks. These are control character codes that if you uh, used a sector editor on this, you'd see all sorts of numbers. But the TI interpreter, it can only show character uh, characters. And so when it gets to something above the legal range of a character definition, it drops out. In Micropendium magazine, I think uh, um, Barry had an article on uh, programs that write programs. And the program that writes BXB was rather extensive. But when you ran it, you wound up with this. And then you'd save it as a, a, a DF or DV163 merge format. So that's all the hard work mm. it does to, uh, and there's all sorts of, you know, embedded assembly and stuff in there. Hmm. Now, if we could have on that thumb drive giveaway, I had a few modules. Ah. So pick out a module you want to run. Sure. And I'll have to find my CF. Here's my CF ma manual, which has the interpreter in it. And I've been touting how, how simple the TI is. Mm -hmm. If you remember at the picnic, um, one of my neighbors at the marina, Gary Rudd, uh, had never heard of the TI, and uh, we showed it to him and told him about it. Um, and uh, you remember, he, he, uh, he was amazed that uh, anything could be simple, that you could just turn it on and it would automatically do something and didn't have to, uh, to load a bunch of things. Hmm. Hmm. Oh. Dee -dee -dee. So what happens when you have one more than one memory card? See the Sucrets container around here? Somewhat. Large one right here? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, that's got my compact flash cards in it. And that's what happens when you have multiple libraries. And you can only fit so much on one of these cartridges. I love the fact that we've got everything labeled because I have a bunch of flash drives and every time I want to look for something, I have to insert them sequentially and pull them out again and uh, it's annoying as hell. It's, it's, it's worse, much worse than the TI. Because there's no such thing as a disk directory uh, that would list. I've got one of these. I think you're um, mistaken. Like a grand widget, you know, with 12, mm -hmm. 12 slots. Six of them do not work. Mm -hmm. um, and when you plug it in, it gets crazy. Okay, with any luck. This is disc number 614 from the uh, Jim Peterson Tiger Cub collection, which is patriotic music. Okay. And now it's here in 17. Let's look at number 17. Oh, okay. It, uh, this disc has been renumbered or renamed. So I have to run these uh, uh, manually. You don't have to clean the place up. They have a, a guy that comes in and does it. I just want to get the guys off for four minutes. I think.
I did something wrong there. That's extended basics. I pressed the space bar to automatically load it. Where if you press the enter key, it's trying to load it with editor assembler. All the things you got to know. Oh, I want to disk uh, 616, 617. few stars up there, but how many? Let's see, a one, a two, three. Uh, this is it. I've never heard it with a prelude like that before. Yeah, right. It is? Yeah. Actually, there's a technical error. That nobody's ever pointed out uh, in the comics or in the movie that uh, there was a written description that Captain America's uniform had 13 alternating red and white stripes on it, which is impossible. Uh, where he's got the red and white alternating stripes around his waist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, I think somebody only said that once, and then they realized, oops. You know, they, they made a boo boo there. Two eight nine nine nine. Does that go back to the host program? Cool. Well, let's look at it. Oh. Like a run, the like run disk one dot home program or something. One more nine in there. You got an extra eight. Mm. Two eight nine nine nine. I'll get this right yet. Yeah, see, this disk has been renamed mm -hmm. for my library sy uh, system. It's no longer called Patriotic. Uh, it's got a uh, volume number on it for my convenience. So I would probably have to go in there and rename this disk. Okay. Oops. Ah, hell. Let's do it in drive one anyway, because it's going to have a load program. Would I say that other disk I wanted was 616? Yeah, because you've got all sorts of commands in rich extended base. I can call EA. You can do the D for the directory. You've got your editor here. You can load and run, run a program file, or just uh, rich extended basic. And you tell it which drive to load the load pro program from. Oh, there is no load on there. Directory. Let's look at this one. Yeah, there is a load program there. Discs that have a number of related programs on a similar topic. When you get a disc kind of like this one, it's got 18 different programs on it, uh, games and, and utilities and everything else. Sometimes it's very difficult to remember what's what, you know, what's what. Sure. Um, but I've got a lot of those discs. Oh, God. Can't. Oh, okay. It's an automatic runner. Again, it's looking for a disc with the disc name of Christmas. Okay. It's interesting. I've never used that before in any of my programs. I've always used a numbered disc. Yeah, and I renamed a bunch of this stuff to put it on the compact flash. Yeah. So you can call it by volume name. Right, call it by disc name. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, um, Multiplan so started is that. Is way to software redefine a... Um, volume name to a disk number? 
Yeah, you can just change it. change it. You know, what, what is German? German? What, what is that? Uh, uh, is that, is that, that a version of one of these songs? German? Let's find out. We got Christmas Carol. We got German. Press the space bar. I think you just have to go into the line numbers and change instead of saying disk dot Christmas, make it disk one, make it yeah. hard yeah. hard coded to disk. Yeah, because Multiplan did that, so you can have the disk in any one of your three physical Let's floppy drives, and it would look for it. Since it's the season, some Christmas music. Did you find a module you wanted to run? Uh, V-Mod's 18. In July, it's in July. Just, wow. just, just wondered why they didn't call it. I suppose they, 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 they with the, with the... Uh, I thought it was going to show all German language uh, words there. Well, I think that um, with the naming convention um, and the TI, certain times you can't... Uh, if, if you truncated it to say germ, that would be a little bit uh, mm -hmm. uh, off-putting. And uh, now it could have been, could have been. Wasaya, uh, Weedax. You could have probably got Kinderlein on there. Like uh, maybe not. So. Maybe that would not have fit. Ah, poo, I hit the wrong key. Binox, that's yeah. um, Christmas. Binox is Christmas. I hit the enter key out of habit. But in rich extended basic, that's for only for loading uh, editor assembler programs. It's a space bar that loads the extended basic. Let's see what this one says. Then I'll have to switch cartridges back. What was that? VMods 18? 18, yeah. No to you. Here you go. Why are you doing me this? So you could uh, translate a long while it's playing. Oh, I thought you wanted me to sing. Yeah. What happens? You know, many people have heard me sing in public and have gone on to live perfectly normal lives, but <laughs> why risk it? Uh, what is that? I have no idea what this. Uh, now, my wife would know what this one was. She knows all the old Christmas songs in German. She'd even sing it for you, but uh, I can't do that. <laughs> and what's more, I wouldn't do that. Okay, we're gonna shift gears again. Oh, here, here you go. Shift that back to you, okay. And by, I can only fit so much of a library on a compact flash card. As you can see, I had to put a grip here so I had something to push against to unplug it. Mm. Just a piece of uh, Velcro. You're amazing. You're my hero. Uh, my hero too. Yeah, he has his time to do all this stuff. And uh, he does it. Yeah, the night before the meeting. <laughs> and everything's cataloged and boxes and boxes. And stuff in plastic uh, holders. And We're gonna to have to take up a collection and have uh, Dawn, uh, Autumn rather, uh, have Autumn move here so that you don't have to move there. Oh yeah. Because. Uh, Who's gonna have the show for Yeah, without, without, without you, but, uh, mm -hmm. there is no show. Okay, so here is the. Uh, Just Jim and me dancing, you know. <laughs> okay, so here's what it is. I reserved the first 10 volumes for my utilities okay. And uh, Victor's modules don't start until 11, so I, all I have to do is add 10. So Owen wants VMODs 18, so I would ask for volume 28. Okay. I gotta write this down. So you call on mount one, that removes the virtual floppy from the virtual drive. And we want 
virtual disk 28 in virtual drive number one. This is actually quicker than going through your physical library and pulling the disk out and doing it. Okay, go ahead, Owen. That's all yours. Have fun exploring. Yeah. So I'm, I'm all loaded up, huh? Yeah. There's the windscreen. Go ahead. <clears throat> the, uh, so put the windscreen on the uh, microphone. So you select extended basic. It, it uh, makes it a lot better. Select extended basic. It should auto load the uh, load program that I see is on here. Sure. Okay. Disc one? Yeah. There you go. Okay. Okay, so if that's... So this is uh, module uh, disc number 18? Yes. From the giveaway from the fair? Mm -hmm. It's under VMODs. Under VMODs, number 18, okay. <clears throat> Let's try this one real quick. A lot of people might recognize this game from other platforms. Hmm, yeah. Oh, okay. Can you see those incoming? Yeah, I can see it on their phone. Too. Okay. This works actually exceptionally well with the trackball. I the, uh, mine at home. Yeah, we go track mines at home too. Somebody was looking for a TI trackball. Everybody wants something in GI. Well, you can modify the so Atari. You can them with an controller when yeah. they ask you for that. Yeah, you can modify an Atari trackball for a TI. Okay. But I bought one of each just for. I didn't know you could mod modify one. I thought that uh, because it requires power that you couldn't. Yeah, you put in a wall board. Hmm. Uh oh. So this game starts off fairly simple at the early stages. Pretty soon you'll start to see some some screamers. They'll come in super fast. So what do you got at the bottom there? An oil from left to right. An oil tanker, a radar dish, an aircraft, mm -hmm. a couple cars, a, a semi trailer, a helicopter, another airplane. And if you'll notice the uh, oh here's a screamer here. The uh, the number of windows on those little buildings represent the number of uh, missiles that you have left to fire mm -hmm. from that particular um, cannon before the end of the level, and it'll reset at the end of the level. Yeah, I've seen different techniques on playing this where uh, with the roller controller, people would lay out a line across the top of the screen to indiscriminately just try to catch anything that's coming in yeah. and not really aim for them. Uh, you go through a lot of shots. Yeah, this one has a what's that's what's part of what's challenging about this one. It gives you a very limited number of shots, mm -hmm. and on these early levels, it seems like you have plenty, like you wouldn't need much. But Bruce Harrison wrote a version of this uh, uh -huh. Scud Buster. Yes. And uh, was it pink? Shoot down, uh, incoming Scud missiles. Yes, it was during the uh, Operation Gulf Desert War. Storm. I think it was. Yeah, Desert Storm or yeah, one of the Gulf Wars. Desert Shield. De well, one of them. Desert Shield, I think, was the first one. Yeah. yeah. And uh, wherever wherever Hussein was firing the uh, Scud missiles into uh, into Israel, I think. Yeah. Uh oh. Wait, that one just made a left turn. <laughs> oh shoot. Uh oh. I'm in deep trouble now. Now you're in trouble. Oops, deep trouble. Oh. I think you're gonna lose something else there. Well, that did, that level did not go as I had planned. <laughs> Yeah, he uh, actually gave credit to, uh, uh, oh, hell, the guy who wrote the, the Sprites manual. Nick Aguilar? No, no. no uh, uh, he was a heavy dude in the TI world. Uh, Miller? Craig Miller, Craig Miller yeah. wrote the, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Smart Programmer's Guide for Sprites? Right. Yeah. 
and uh, that's uh, like a Bible. Yeah. He has uh, putting your commands and your reflexes and everything in one line of code, uh, so the game is more responsive. So it's not going through three lines of code, and you're breaking your joystick, and your guy's sitting there getting clobbered uh, and not moving. And uh, he also had a routine of having your shot always hit the target you're aiming for, uh, no matter how the target moves after that. It was like an automatic thing. If you had the cursor around the target and you hit the fire button, your shot would eventually hit the target. Hmm. That's and uh, remember, Craig Miller did the uh, Miller's graphics disc that had Blackbeard's treasure, and uh, I think it had a uh, pyramid adventure, uh, you know, Ferris Pyramid. Uh, he had a whole bunch of different games on that that uh, and he got pissed off and left. showed off. Uh, well, he you know copy protected his discs and then published the routines on how to copy any disc, no matter how it was copied. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you can see how you got vexed. That was a problem for a lot well, of people. Yeah, a lot of people got into the TI market to make some money, and when they discovered that, you know, somebody was buying one, one somebody in each group was buying one copy, and then the whole group was getting a, a, a version of it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that was, uh, so finally the idea of became uh, I'll give this away if people, um, I won't expect to make any money from it. If people, it's fairware, people want to send me something out of the goodness of their heart or sits out of their guilty conscience, uh, they'll do so. Well, all the Tiger Cup stuff was like that. Yeah. It was either freeware or shareware. Uh, a lot of times they asked for money. the Lima Fair, and that was yeah. the only place that was available. Yeah. Um, Jim never came to our, at least he didn't come to any of the later affairs. Yeah, uh, I, I met think him, I believe it, a fair, uh, it might have been Milwaukee or something like that. I might have been driving. Did you ever go to Lima? Yeah, I think I went there once with Dave Connery. Yeah, oh, oh, you'd remember but, that. But you'd remember Jim, that. He had like two card tables set up Yeah. with big cardboard boxes filled with rows of numbered floppies. You yeah. know, it was just sitting there on a uh, folding chair next to the table. Very calm. And very uh, very quiet, not calling attention or anything. Mm -hmm. And I went nice. Oh, that's Tiger Cup. And I pulled out my shopping list. And I'm digging through the disc. Oh, give me one of these, two of these. And I want one of this, I want this, I want that. And uh, I felt like a show because then about 500 people came up and they were interested in it now. Yeah. You know, now that there's some activity, I said, well, here's this catalog of all these discs. And I'd already asked for his catalog and gotten it, and I had my Christmas shopping list. Yeah. So I knew what I wanted. Another thing is, somewhere, someplace, I met the fourth programmer, Earl Raguse. Hmm. And this is a long time ago. And I told him I was interested in Ford. And he went like, gosh, I didn't know anybody was still interested in Ford. Uh, so uh, a couple of weeks later, I got in the mail a copy, a Xerox copy of the Xerox of the Xerox of his starting point newsletter articles. And they're so smudged, uh, I don't want to scan them again. I think I'm going to have to reset them. I'm going to have to retype those articles. I've got the, I just discovered while I was looking for the speech synthesizer today, I just discovered a fourth manual. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, um, I've got the I've got um, Lee Stewart's fourth Let manual. Him hit the what did God do? <laughs> Oops! Yeah, might as well just defend your base at this point. I'm going for points, though, really. Yeah. Okay. I like this as much. Maybe we had this uh, game as a high score competition game uh, last year, and uh, I don't remember who won. It wasn't me. I came close, but I didn't win. But uh, <clears throat> it it gets to the point where. It gets so fast and so heavy that you struggle very mightily. These things will make, uh, they're not linear in motion, they will make turns. Yeah, some of them will. Oh, look at this, Jesus. Oh, they missed it. They missed my last guy. To add insult to injury. Oh, you got one car left. Well, that's, yeah, so I get my, my bases back now, so. <laughs> yeah, it must be an AMC. Yeah, on the uh, Forbidden Planet Facebook page, they show that uh, triangular doorway to the Krill Laboratory, and they said if uh, form follows function, you know, why is this doorway shaped so like this? So I uh, 
I posted for fun, I posted a picture of an AMC Pacer. <laughs> and I said maybe they were shaped like this. That's why that doorway was. <laughs> well, that was an unfortunate series of events right there. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, just, why did they need two feet of car metal? metal. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so close. You know? yeah. It's like, what? Because you have a self destruct button back there? No. no. Why do they have that in the uh, combination wow. for, for something? You don't see that anywhere else in the world. Then they showed that little shuttle car where they go a, a couple miles to get there. Yeah. They go, how the hell wow. did the fit in there? You know, can you depress one? Yeah, then you then I showed a picture of it. I don't think so, no. Of the elevator car from the St. Louis Arch. <laughs> and I said, well, of bullets. Kid, you know, five people, you got to sit. All you have to do is just like shoot anything that's right over the car. They actually had it lit up with right. a blue glow inside. I said, it's even lit up like the shuttle car. Oh, now you got two cars. So it was a lot of fun. Oh, toast. I decided to defend the cars, now I can't defend anything. <laughs> Yeah, well, you don't hit the cars, you get yeah. another shot, right? Oh, it's like those cartoons showing a Star Wars story. Wow, trooper, look at that. And he can't hit the urinal hanging on the wall, the and he's all upset. How did you get a yeah, second Stuff car. like that when I started. They start rebuild if you get to certain point levels. Okay. Oh, I lost one. Well, they're all closed at the same time. That's yeah. why yeah. they sound the same. Well, they could just shot yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Too many iterations. <laughs> yeah. That's it, I died. That may be my high score ever. So. 444,780. It's not this. too bad. 444,780, not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> and all the scenes she's in, they miss. And then when she leaves, oh, now they can hit their target. Hey, Vic, uh, some re request on... Uh, YouTube here for this. Oh, okay. That's right. So we're gonna do we're gonna do parallax and uh, sometimes 99er I believe was the programmer of this. Oh, okay. And he has requested. Uh, well, he saw that he saw that we used it for our <laughs> for yeah for our main thing. Three. So I see you did parallax. I said, oh, we did it before we started. I'll go ahead and do it again. So yeah, I think he's gonna be hanging it's out not watching for work. me. Uh, you gotta flip it. Flip it to. Face. Wow. Okay. Okay. That's funny. How did that get out? Seven Caesar posted. Parallax Starfield. Oh, I did? Who's asking for that? Sometimes 99er. Oh, that's Karsten. Yeah, the uh, Karsten, the, uh, he's created this, yeah, which I'm is really awesome. Him. I'm glad to see him still. Uh, I haven't seen him programming anything lately. Yeah, this uh, was strange. Uh, uh, Jim Fenster correctly represented the cartridge and saying, yes, it's not an arcade game or something. It displays the stars. But uh, I got it anyway, because I thought, oh, this we need to see. So we've got a snowfall right now. Just this, is time for Christmas. this is new. This is a new game, right? Yes, this is new uh, from the uh, fair this year. Ah, uh, great. And it is in cartridge form here. I'm, I'm glad to see oh, something coming from Carson. Uh, I've still had Carson on uh, uh, Skype, but I, mm -hmm. because it's an eight hour time difference, I don't think mm -hmm. I've ever called him. All right. So joystick up, left. And joystick up, left, down, and it, you, it's very responsive, and you can actually slow the motion down to next to nothing, or even stop it, maybe. Yeah, there we go. So as you go, it's it's a uh, parallax scrolling. Your larger items are in front, probably have higher or lower sprite numbers. The items farther back in the mid-range are slightly smaller and go slightly faster, and they're probably the mid-range sprite numbers. The ones in the far back, I believe, are going to be the higher sprite numbers, the smallest, and with the slowest speed. Now, he may have done some really clever stuff on here to get rid of the uh, four sp sprites on a line. Uh, well, that's an artifact of the F-18. Uh, it will not uh, mask over lower, uh, lower number sprites. Okay. Uh, however, there's a switch on the board. You can have it be original TI mode, only four sprites on a line. Yeah. Or you can have it go to F-18 mode, unlimited sprites on a line. I haven't tried putting 32 sprites on one line, but um, so when you play a game like Burger Time, uh, usually you get artifacts with the, because uh, you can't easily have sure. multiple characters on one line in Burger Time as they pursue you. Now, I thought of putting a switch on this console so I could just switch back and forth and demonstrate it. That means I'd have to open it up again. You know the faulty Eric and Monsterland cartridge? Yeah. Caesar's cartridge is the same thing. 
that's interesting to find out. I'm glad we showed that. We well, you know, we haven't showed it yet on the on the screen, so we need to show that too. Okay, go ahead. Tell, hey, Karsten, tell your wife hello and tell her we'd love to see her in the U.S. and you too. She can bring you along if she wants to. We're having a lot of fun here. And we're eating Malamars. I don't know if you guys have those where you are, but these are Malamars. And they are glorious. They are glorious. Absolutely glorious. They are incredible. They are only shipped in the wintertime. Okay, so we're going to try Eric and Monsterland again here. Uh, Eric and Monsterland is a game by one of our one of our own folks on Atari Age. There, um, he's a pretty cool dude. He does a lot of stuff for the uh, a lot of games for the community. <clears throat> and this is one of my favorite games of his. Unfortunately, this particular cartridge, and I'll show the picture of it here. We seem to be having an issue with this cartridge. The issue is that uh, when you when you start up when you start up. The uh, your character dies immediately. Until the game's over. Yeah. Your son said somebody else is having the same Caesar's cartridge did the same thing. Is that what he said? It looks like uh, we had this is the second cartridge where we have this issue. So it did not do Caesar's that when I bought said. it. Just hang on, son. Um, so Vic says that when we when he bought the cartridge at first, it didn't do this, and now it is doing it. So I'm wondering if it's a uh, if it's a concern, um, something that's happening, did you do it on this console or was it on a different console, Vic? Uh, another console. Was it an F-18 console or no? No, it was a regular console. Okay. And I was able to run and jump, but I couldn't seem to get my timing right. Okay. So this did not, this issue did not happen on the standard 9918 uh, console. I don't know if that's the problem, but it is happening on the F-18 console. Well, and we'll show it right it now. I get home. Put it on the other console and see if it uh, crashes. <clears throat> All right, we'll push stick up to play. So as you can see, your character dies before you can do anything with it. And that's the biggest issue. See? Yeah. I... I have tried running some disc games are from Germany where they use uh, 50 hertz current or something like that, and my characters would always quickly die on the uh, 60 hertz current. Of course, if I'd actually played that game, I'm not sure the results would have been any different if it was working. <laughs> well, I was able to move them before, but like I said, it's on the other machine. On my other console, it's a stock console. The cartridge board port is giving me a hard time. i got to take it apart and clean it something I'm not looking forward to doing. Hmm. Yeah, and I don't know why it's doing that specifically, but um, but it is. And we got the 32K with the compact flash uh, CF7 here. Yeah, that's... that's it's applying the 32K. That's something else we need to talk about, too, is all your other stuff here. So it's a it's an F-18 console, 32K being supplied by the... His, is that a NanoPeb or a CF7? It's a CF7 with the, uh, with the serial port on the back. Okay. Remember that joke on the Mm-hmm. When it said, okay. this is a real serial port and it didn't pour in serial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually I want to hook up my MIDI master cables to that, but that would seem to be so much weight hanging off the back end of that thing. I think we played this one before. Didn't we play this before we started, before we went yeah, live yeah. too? Yeah. So Vic just got this game at the uh, fair. I think he bought it from Jim Fetzner, right? No, that was a door prize, actually. It was a donation by Jim Fetzner. Oh, and, great. Uh, Vic wanted it to be banquet. <laughs> this was a door prize donated by Jim Fetzner. Uh, this is, I had this game on disc for many years. Press down for play. Oh, yeah. I guess I better read the screen, huh? Yeah, I did the same game. Let's see if we can get some volume here. Well, you can turn that up and then they'll hear it on the first floor. Yeah, I had a, uh, at work I have trouble hearing my radio. Quentin used that same uh, tone, that, that clinking sound uh, on, uh, I think it was Breakout, uh, when it, uh, when it uh, shattered one of the uh, tiles. Hmm. 
Yeah, this this was a was this 1989? Is that right? So this yeah. this was a pretty cool. This was pretty amazing stuff yeah. from 1989. Yeah. Now that I got my final ROM ordered, I have to find out how I can turn a disk file into a ROM file for uh, uh, or an editor assembler program into a uh, bin file for the final ROM and flash ROM. I think I read once it's not straightforward. There's a, I think there's a program called uh, C-Save, and that takes cartridges and oh. turns them into... Yeah, I got that with my first uh, super space cartridge, uh, C-Vac and C-Save. Yeah, I think that's how you do it. And I think also with... Uh, that was what I used before the P-Gram. Mm -hmm. I've got a, a P-Gram at home in my P-Box, and uh, that's what I found extremely handy. Mm. For all those cartridge files on the last fair giveaway where it says from Victor, there's uh, V mods and there's V carts. So all the farts are in PGRAM graham cracker format. And the modules are uh, disc collections I bought at various fairs that uh, just happen to have module files on there. Uh, there's about five different versions of, believe it or not, Munchman. <laughs> and if you play them in a row, you can see uh, differences in the programs. They were not all the same. Uh, so all I can imagine is some of these programs were engineering prototypes, not the final re release that we're all uh, that we all know and love. And some, well, at least we played. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. And, this looks like a uh, version of the old uh, Tato cabinet game, Alcon. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, he had uh, two or three versions of uh, this war zone, and then he had, um, uh, oh, my favorite one, the living tomb. Uh, we demonstrated that yeah. about uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, we've got a three-dimensional tomb to go through, and it's booby-trapped, and uh, every time you play it, it's always the same tomb. So, if you map, so you can map it out and or memorize it. And uh, I've uh, never got more than halfway through the second level on that. It's a tough game for me. Oh, boy. I'm looking forward to seeing the um, finished uh, product of um, uh, Tursi's uh, game. Has he, has he released that yet? Is that Dragon Flare? Right? Yeah, is that out? No. It's red. It's close, very close. very close. He had to create a brand new cartridge for it. That has what 512 megabytes? Yeah, something ridiculous like that. Yeah, 512 megabyte cartridge. Mm -hmm. Well, something that they do like an experiment. <laughs> hey, Matt says don't convert Malamars to cartridges. It's not going to work. Might be able to make okay. it a little warmer if you start to heat the heat. Okay, so plugging in my flash ROM cartridge, which plays every third-party game cartridge ever made, but doesn't play any. TI cartridges because they use Groms. Ah, so here we got uh, 4 a Oh, I was going to run 4A Flyer too because that's on here. Uh, in the upper right corner, you can see the comma and the period and the numbers 1 to 4. So this is screen number 1. Now we're on screen number 2 of 4. Jumpy, Jungle Hunt. Screen three, micro pinball two. That yeah, was a great game. Uh -huh. uh, Moon Patrol, Ms. Pac-Man. Uh, TI has got the best ports of uh, Atari uh, arcade machine games. Pac-Man, things like that. Pitfall. That's Philip Van Boren, isn't it? Yep. Retro clouds. Okay, so yeah. The, uh, <laughs> we couldn't get Eric and Monsterland to run, but... So this is this is again is all the <laughs> this is all timing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm uh actually I had a pitfall standalone uh hand uh, 
hand game I gave away at the fair a few years ago. Uh, because I'm no good at this kind of a game. And uh, the recipient got it as a door prize and was just uh, pleased as punch to... Uh, <laughs> what do you mean you're not, you're not good? Usually I can't make it to the pit. Uh, well done, sir. Now you gotta wait till the alligators. Yeah, you gotta run across the alligators while their mouth is shut. Oh, a game over. Oh, well. <laughs> you can actually stand on, the, on their head. That's a scorpion. Right the if you go underground, you can only go so far, and that guy tries to get you. The scorpions are a little challenging because you've got to jump at the right time because otherwise they turn the direction and get you from behind. Okay, so go back to the title bar screen. Press the reset button on the flash ROM. So otherwise we'll get the same cartridge over again. Let's try 4A flyer blind without the instructions. Now the weather, you wouldn't think much about it, but normally when you're flying in 4A Flyer, it's clear weather. Uh, you could have cold weather where it's icy yeah. and rainy and that affects the performance of your airplane. Yeah. Uh, or if you have hot weather, your engine doesn't have any power, it's weak. And uh, yeah, so this one... Uh, I don't remember how to play this. No, I don't remember on this. I definitely need the docs on this. But, uh, yeah, you have your visual indicator there of the runway. You can take off and land. Uh, yeah, this is one of those, you got to pick up your gear before you hit 150 miles an hour. Yeah. Or your aircraft yeah. crashes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. under in his room. Sorry. Let's pick up and pick it. Yeah, I think we're going to pick them all. They're all stuck together. So beyond pl Parsec. This is the one where you can shoot at the, um, I don't know what they are, uh, space clouds or whatever, Yeah. and, and move them backwards. Um, and you can actually make them stand still. Yeah. And shoot at the top. Well, this is the rocky one. Okay. I guess those are asteroids. Or, uh, okay. That's how you shoot yourself down by running into one of them. I don't like this monitor. You have to be a little careful because they come in behind you. Yeah, oops. I hate shooting myself down. <laughs> uh, what was it for the uh, MBX system that they had a... I think I came off on the other side of the screen. Oh, there. come on. This is me versus Vic, by the way. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. I'm playing against Vic here. Yeah, see, you can, you can make them go backwards like that. That's. I, I once upon a time got them all to stop. I don't know why I wasted so much time, but I got them all to stop and lined up in a row. You know. Yeah. Now, as uh, John Phillips said, uh, the uh, Beyond Parsec, uh, they uh, published this game, and uh, T.I. Snivelled that they used the word parsec. It was not a public do domain word. Yeah. So here, excuse me, let me quit this one, because you were winning. <laughs> That's fine, just quit whenever. There we go. Yeah, it says uh, Beyond Parsec by John Phillips. So if we quit this. Reset the uh, cartridge. Uh, go to H, Beyond Space, you'll see it's the same game, but now it's published by Video Magic a year or two later. Yeah. So you press the Any key, so here it is. You know, remind me to get rid of that darn uh, asteroid up there. I keep running into that pesky thing. And I suck at being on space. I was really good at being on Parsec, though. <laughs> Seeing how it's the same game. Uh, were there any uh, tidbits about the uh, designs on the bottom of the screen? One of, 
There was something in here. They're very similar. They, they said something about one of them. Oh, uh, I, I remember um, what he was talking about was uh, one of the one of the programmers were writing his initials. Oh into, yeah. Uh, the various uh, things in the. Well, well, Parsec itself, yeah, they put Easter eggs in it. Yeah. Yeah, Jed and Herb. U R B would be Paul Urbanus, obviously, or Urbanus. Yeah. And then. Uh, oh yeah, the names of the uh, aliens. Yeah, but in the in the pictures that are in the uh, actual stuff on the bottom of the screen, you can see U R B when you play Parsec. You can see U R B and Yeah. yeah. If you get that far. Yeah. 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 I like the one game uh, Microsurgeon. Where, uh, with speech, uh, the uh, res uh, the uh, paging system calls paging Dr. Levine. Well, that's the last name of the guy who wrote the program. Yeah. Matthew so Splett says, go in for a direct shot. Uh, I don't think I can. Just so you know, Matthew Splett says, go in for a direct shot. Well, that worked for you. <laughs> I'm gonna light you up now. Yeah. Did you go in for that direct shot? I did. Oh, come on. I must have. Hey, we're neck and neck now, man. <laughs> this is gonna be for the. This is be for the title here. We're playing for thanks. I win your ship. I win. <laughs> oh, come on. That wasn't even fair. That thing came right up behind me. Oh, oh, they don't reset them for uh, for a new ship. They're still moving the same way, uh, the way the way they were before. Now all I have to do is sit in the shadows and wait for you to destroy yourself. This is pretty simple. Gotcha. Well done. Oh man, look at that! Look what just happened to me. <laughs> Oh, you won. Okay, you're the new president. You, you get to you get to bring all the equipment every month now. <laughs> oh gosh. Good job, Vic. <laughs> Hell, it was neck and neck. Vic, you got my vote, buddy. <laughs> Uh, I think we're about running out of time. Yeah, I think we're at 4.02 right now. Yeah, uh, there's no yeah, we are. following us, so I, uh, we can take our time break it down. But hey, Dad, were you blue? No. Oh, well. Hey, Dad. <laughs> well, I think it's time to say goodbye until next year. That's uh, right. This is the last one of the year. Yeah. Holy cow. <laughs> next time it'll be 2019, believe it. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I don't know. And and it's time is not linear, you know. When you're sitting in the dentist chair, <laughs> you're there forever. Yeah. But when you're when you're waiting for your birthday or Christmas or something, uh, mm -hmm. time goes much more slowly than than when you're on the job. You sure. Know what I mean? <laughs> That's over like that, you know. Boom and and uh, done. And then you got to reload. You know. You gotta, <laughs> <laughs> oh man! I don't seem to have our usual sign-off screen. Oh, we find easily we available. You gotta find it, big. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I have the flag. Oh, I have the flag. Either that or we gotta <laughs> sing. Uh, so find it. Well, I had that one disc of uh, patriotic games there. Well, yeah, but that's not quite good enough. Yeah, you too, Carson. Or patriotic Happy music. Year, yeah. Happy New Year to all of our viewers out there and all of our friends watching. Yeah. Carson just said uh, happy, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. So back okay. at you, buddy. It. Okay. Maybe it's on uh, utilities there. I'll try that one. I'm out. By the way, once this uh, live feed ends, this video will be viewable for eternity on YouTube. So, whether you like it or not, whether you like it or not, it's yeah. going to be on yeah. there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, no, I don't have it. So. All right. Well, then we have to sing. Okay. No. How are you going to sing? <laughs>
Right, you want to sign us up here? <coughs> yeah, well, thanks for watching. Um, this has been the Chicago TI um, user group December 1918 and 1918. Oh, that, was, that would have been about the second, the first world war. Now this is 2018, the end of 2018. And uh, we hope to see you all again uh, in the new year, 2019. Until then, from us, bye. Wave, Vic. Wave bye. Hi. Jim. So long. Bye bye. Black. You want to wave bye? Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh. So, yeah, I gotta take this cartridge home Wait, and try it on a regular yeah. TI. I don't know. Is it see over? if that's an F 18. Is it over, Buck? Look, look at the camera. Tell us. See if it's over. Ask him. Is it over? I don't know. It might, might not be. It's not 